There is an incredible and dangerous world, and it's not in deep space. This is Earth. This planet is huge, powerful, and in many ways, even scary. And yet, it's the most beautiful thing we've ever seen in our lives. Our mother, and a mother to every living thing we know. But at the same time, it's full of mysteries and secrets. In this video, we'll take a great trip to see the most mysterious places of our planet. We'll find out their secrets and why they are so remarkable. Let's dive under the ice of Antarctica and Greenland to see if there's life here that was isolated for millions of years and took its own evolutionary course. Let's see what the sands of the Sahara and the Egyptian pyramids hide. What's under them? You'll see and hear what Soviet scientists found when they dug the deepest well in the world. And finally, we'll go down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and under the Bermuda Triangle. Mysteries of the Planet Earth. Fifty-three million years ago, it was so warm here that the shores were filled with palm trees and the air temperature rose above 20 degrees Celsius. And just recently, the temperature dropped to minus 89.2 degrees Celsius in this place. It is the fifth largest continent in the world. 99% of the mainland is covered with ice, which is on average three kilometers thick. It stores about 80% of all freshwater reserves on the planet. And you are not allowed to be here if you haven't removed your wisdom teeth or appendix. This is Antarctica. The surface of its mainland is well studied, but as always, the most interesting stuff is hidden deep inside. Well, it's time to find out what lies under those thick layers of ice. Is there life there? And does it resemble ours? What was found under Antarctica? Please subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. It was Russian scientist Peter Kropotkin who proposed the existence of fresh water under the glaciers of Antarctica at the end of the 19th century. He argued that the tremendous pressure exerted by the combined mass of thousands of square meters of ice could reduce the melting threshold in the lowest parts of the glacier to the point where the ice turns into liquid water. And soon, such places were really found. As of 2021, about 400 such lakes have been identified. One of these lakes is of great interest to scientists. The reservoir is about half a million years old. It's a real treasure trove of knowledge about the world and possibly prehistoric life forms. Meet the Lake Vostok. The existence of a lake under the Russian Vostok station was proposed in 1966 based on satellite images, which showed that a reservoir could be located under four kilometers of ice. Only in 1996, this information was confirmed and the boundaries of the lake were established, combining various data. Lake Vostok is 250 kilometers long, 50 kilometers wide, and spans across 12,500 square kilometers, which is approximately equal to the area of Sydney. According to various estimates, its depth ranges from 600 to 1,200 meters. This is slightly less than in the deepest Lake Baikal. In terms of volume, Lake Vostok occupies the fifth place on our planet. That is, a gigantic reservoir, which is one of the five largest lakes on the planet, is buried under 4,000 meter thick ice. Can you imagine that? And this is hidden from our eyes. In terms of altitude, it is located 500 meters below sea level, which makes it one of the lowest lakes on planet Earth. 
it seems that the water in the lake was conserved and remained untouched for 15 to 25 million years. In fact, it's so ancient that it emerged ages before the Homo sapiens. The average water temperature of the lake is minus three degrees Celsius. One might wonder, why doesn't the lake freeze? This happens because the adjacent layer of ice exerts high pressure on top and the lake's bed is heated by geothermal heat from the Earth's core. The environment of Lake Vostok is saturated with nitrogen and oxygen. It is believed that the huge mass of continental ice, which creates a pressure of about 350 atmospheres, contributes to a high concentration of nitrogen and oxygen, which is 50 times higher than in ordinary freshwater lakes. Keep in mind that car wheels have a pressure of only two atmospheres. The lake's tremendous pressure poses an extreme challenge for survival. But what hides inside the lake? To find it out, scientists started to drill a well in 1989. In 1998, researchers working at Vostok Station dug one of the longest ice cores in the world. A joint team from Russia, France, and America drilled and analyzed a 3,623-meter-long ice core. The age of ice samples from cores drilled near the surface of the lake is estimated at 420,000 years. However, drilling was deliberately stopped at about 100 meters above the estimated boundary between the ice sheet and the lake's waters. This was done to prevent pollution of the lake from freon and kerosene, which kept the well from freezing. In November 2010, Scientists presented the final environmental assessment of the project to the Environmental Protection Committee for the Antarctic Treaty, and they were given the green light to go ahead and sample the ancient waters. In 2011, drilling was resumed. In February 2012, Valery Lukin, the head of the Russian expedition to Antarctica, said that his team had only 50 meters left to drill to the surface of Lake Vostok. Then the thermal drill sensor detected liquid water. At this point, scientists stopped the drill and pulled it out of the hole. Removing the drill lowered the pressure beneath, pulling water into the well. The researchers allowed the lake's waters to freeze in a core, and a few months later took samples of this newly formed ice and sent it to a laboratory. But what did they find there? Before 1998, a team led by Scott Rogers from Bowling Green University in Ohio had discovered 3,507 unique gene sequences from ice samples taken about 170 meters above the surface of Lake Vostok. But this find was highly questioned by the scientific community. Sergei Bulat, a microbiologist at the St. Petersburg Institute of Nuclear Physics, believes that this is nothing more than contamination because his group examined the same set of samples and established that it was contaminated. Eski Willerslev, one of the world's most renowned ancient DNA specialists, is also critical of this find. He finds it suspicious that cultures that have been isolated for millions of years would be identical or almost identical to the known microbial sequences found outside the lake. This indicates that at least some of the sequences obtained are the result of contamination. Still, some of the discoveries have been confirmed. The first discovery was made in 2004, when an extremophile was found at a depth of 3,607 meters. These organisms use inorganic substances as the source of energy. Such bacteria are able to survive in extreme conditions. Keep in mind that they were found under 3,607 meters of ice. To put this in perspective, this is the equivalent to three Burj Khalifas stacked on top of each other, which coincidentally is the tallest building in the world. As studies have shown, these creatures live comfortably at temperatures of about minus 50 degrees Celsius. Presumably, they were originally found in warm reservoirs at the bottom of the lake. But that's not all. 
In 2014, Sergei Bulat announced the discovery of an absolutely unknown bacterium, which was named W123-10. It has already been found on the drill bit containing water from Lake Vostok. Sergei wrote a scientific paper on this and published it in the PubMed magazine. The most interesting thing is that the bacterium's only 86% genetically similar to all living things known to modern science. This is extremely low and proves that this bacterium has evolved separately from the outside world for millions of years. W123-10 might after all be the only basis for the hypothesis that we weren't always alone in the universe. Lake Vostok may have an environment that has been isolated by ice over millions of years. Theoretically, it might have similar conditions to those in the ice-covered oceans on Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus. We can find something similar there too. Although Lake Vostok's size and mysteriousness are very intriguing, Common sense dictates that we should start exploring more accessible bodies of water, so scientists focused on Lake Willens instead. Lake Willens is nothing like other lakes. The weight of the ice forces the water to rise under the glacier, causing the lake to sit on the side of a hill. This thin, two-meter-deep layer of water, which covers almost 60 square kilometers, is held in a pocket of low pressure created by the ice sheet. On January 27, 2013, scientists broke through the ice cover and reached the lake. Water under high pressure entered the well and filled its lower part by 30 meters. A day later, the first samples were taken from the lake and a camera was sent deep into the lake to take some pictures. It turned out that many different types of bacteria live here. The waters of the lake lie about 800 meters below the ice surface, so they are completely devoid of sunlight. The microorganisms that live there are chemoautotrophic bacteria that receive energy as a result of chemical reactions with inorganic compounds. They produce food using the energy from reduction of iron, sulfur, and nitrogen compounds in the lake, just like plants and algae on the surface of the Earth that produce food using solar energy. This was the first successful extraction of such high-quality specimens from an Antarctic subglacial lake. In 2019, researchers drilled another subglacial reservoir called Mercer Lake which is 600 kilometers away from the South Pole. A core of a length of 1,067 meters was drilled to collect samples from Mercer subglacial lake. It's at this depth that the lake lies under the ice. Moreover, subglacial Antarctic Lake scientific access scientists have collected dirt samples from the bottom of the reservoir. The expedition members placed the dirt under the microscope lens and discovered some elongated structures resembling parts of mushrooms or plants. In addition to these threads, the scientists saw the remains of tardigrades and crustacean exoskeletons. This was quite surprising because no one expected to see anyone more complex than single-celled organisms. If there was nothing strange in the bacteria that feed on the remains of diatoms, then the discovery of tardigrades and fragments of mushrooms took scientists by surprise. It's yet to be determined whether such organisms live in these environments or have been brought there from another place, for example, by moving ice. However, if these were local organisms, this would mean that the scale of life developing under the Antarctic ice is greater than we thought, and this lays the potential for further research. Not small interest is generated by the glaciers alone as well. After all, now they cover about 10% of the total area of the Earth. But what would happen if all this enormous mass of glaciers melt? Where would all the water go? 
What would happen to the oceans? Would salt water mix with fresh water? Further, you will learn what would happen if all the glaciers were gathered together in one place. What parts of the land would remain if all the glaciers melted? What would happen to Antarctica? And finally, what would happen to the flora and fauna? And how might the big melting change the length of day? These are just a few interesting facts. What would happen if all the glaciers melted? The total volume of ice on our planet is roughly estimated at between 25 and 30 million cubic kilometers. Even a person with a good imagination finds it hard to picture how it looks like. Let's try and say that if we were to pack all glaciers in one place, a one kilometer thick ice sheet would be larger in size than all of North America. Now, let's think what would happen if all that ice melts. Of course, the melting would not happen overnight. However, the current data we are going to share with you is very impressive. In a bad way. Back in 2019, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the United Nations published a scientific report on the ocean and the cryosphere. The report resonated widely around the world. The study showed that even small glaciers could add up to almost as much of Greenland's ice. For example, from 2006 to 2015, Greenland lost about 280 billion tons of ice each year, while the remaining glaciers lost 220 billion tons. By comparison, Antarctica lost only 155 billion tons of ice during all that time. The total rate of rise of the ocean's surface during the nearest past years averaged 3.6 millimeters per year. It may seem insignificant, but in fact, changes in the climate accumulate gradually and may come in leaps and jumps. The prediction is that the rate of melting glaciers is likely to increase and accelerate. NASA also made a prediction about the inevitable rise of the sea level by 90 centimeters in the near future. Now, let's imagine that all glaciers melt overnight. Scientists at the University of California, Irvine made a prognosis for such a scenario in the distant future. They predicted that if all the Greenland glaciers melt, sea level will rise by 7.4 meters. If Antarctica melts, the water level will rise by 58 meters. If all the glaciers on the planet were to melt, the water level would rise by 65 meters. What parts of the land will remain? The climate change models show that all coastal areas of all the continents will go under the big water one way or another. It will dramatically change the shape of continents as huge areas of land get submerged. For example, Florida will disappear. The Netherlands, which has been desperately fighting against the encroachment of the sea for the past decades, will eventually lose this battle. So will Denmark. So will much of Northern Europe. St. Petersburg will be underwater, and Venice will finally sink too. The Caspian Sea will become a real sea. Now, it is not even formally a sea, but a giant lake, as it is not connected to the ocean. After all the glaciers have melted, the Black Sea will cover the Caucasus to the east and make a new Bosporus to connect with the ocean. It will increase its size almost twice. China will experience huge floods as it loses part of its land to water. Water will cover the territory of Vietnam and the Philippines. Both countries will be badly affected. Dramatic changes will take place in South America. The Amazon River in Brazil will cease to exist because of a huge gulf formed on its place. It will greatly change the shape of the continent. The same will happen to the Piranha and Uruguay rivers in the lower part of the continent. They will turn into a bay, and the city of Buenos Aires will disappear together with territories at least 100 kilometers deep into the continent. Africa, in comparison with other continents, will lose the least amount of land. However, it is not a reason to rejoice, as rising sea levels will additionally increase the temperature of the air and will make life impossible in most parts of Africa. In addition, Egypt, 
Alexandria and Cairo will be covered by waters of the expanding Mediterranean Sea. As a result of melting of ice and glaciers, the big water will form an inland sea in Australia, and the most part of a narrow coastal zone where many Australians live will disappear underwater. What will happen to Antarctica? What could we see in its place? Contrary to some predictions, the outlines of the continents will not be completely unrecognizable. A time traveler into the future will be able to look at the new maps of the Earth and recognize the contours of Australia, both Americas and Africa. But he or she will be amazed and puzzled by Antarctica, or rather at what he or she will see there instead of its place. The familiar contours of Antarctica are an illusion created by our current climate. In fact, even at the current level of the ocean, if we remove all the ice from Antarctica and leave only the land, we will see a group of large and small islands. And when all the ice caps melt, it will be covered by water or become a large archipelago. What will happen to seawater, flora, and fauna? Almost all glaciers have sedimentary origin. They contain billions and billions of tons of fresh water. All melted water will naturally dilute the salty waters of the ocean, thus reducing its salinity. In turn, desalination will lead to a dramatic ecological catastrophe. Some species of oceanic flora and fauna are bound to be extinguished. It will upset the fragile ecological balance. Some species of plants and animals will die out, while others will suddenly and dramatically increase their populations. It could launch a large-scale chain reaction and cause a global ecological catastrophe in the ocean and land ecosystems. As the salinity drops in the ocean water, it will go up in the groundwater. The significant rise in the ocean level will push saline water deep into the groundwater. It will create more salinated soils, making irrigation of fields and growing most food crops difficult on that land. Decreasing ocean salinity will cause the currents to slow down or even stop. For example, the Gulf Stream, which warms the air around northern Europe, would cease to exist. Of course, with global warming, the British islands would not be threatened by cold temperatures but there could be other drastic consequences. And of course, there are lesser side effects of melting glaciers. You should know that ice has accumulated not even thousands, but hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. No wonder that glaciers have accumulated tons of toxins from volcanic eruptions and other disasters. When they melt, all toxins will be released into the ocean and atmosphere which does not bode well for either. Moreover, there are other hazardous substances frozen and stored in the permafrost. Scientists warn about potentially dangerous chemical compounds, dormant ancient viruses and bacteria to which we have no immunity, or even nuclear waste dumps, which by then could have been abandoned and destroyed in the chaos of global disaster. What will happen to the climate in general? Glacial melting will not occur in isolation from other processes on a planetary scale. The phenomenon consists of dramatic causes and tragic consequences. Global warming will affect ecosystems as well as human health, livelihoods, food security, water supply, and economic growth in many ways. As it accelerates and more water advances onto the land, more coastline becomes uninhabitable. A scientific team of anthropologists, ecologists, and climate change specialists compiled an extensive report after comprehensive investigating, modeling, and researching on the global climate change. The article, Future of the Human Climate Niche, published in the Journal of American National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, drew the attention of the world. It revealed rather grim and frightening data. Predictions show that the areas of our planet with the average annual temperature over 29 degrees will expand from 0.8% to 19% of the Earth's land area by 2070. The impacts are projected to increase steeply with the degree of warming. 
By the way, we want to remind you that 29 degrees Celsius is an average temperature of the Sahara Desert. Temperatures will rise not only in the currently uninhabited desert zone, but also in the densely populated areas with the highest birth rates on the planet. Large areas in South America, India, Africa, Northern Australia, and Southeast Asia could become hot, hostile, and uninhabitable. It could happen even before all glaciers melt. Let us think about the length of the day. It can seem that the day length is unrelated to melting. However, global warming could affect the rotation of the Earth. Let us look at the giant Three Gorges Dam in China on the Yangtze River. It only slowed the rotation of the planet by 0.06 microseconds. Not much, but it is not a zero. When the glaciers melt, water will be pulled from the poles toward the equator due to the Earth's rotation around its axis. That is why the Earth may slow down the speed of rotation and the day will become longer by 10 to 20 seconds. Seconds added to the day do not worry mankind because humans will face more survival challenges. Currently, about 40% of mankind live close to water at up to 70 meters above sea level. As the water level rises, coastal cities and entire islands will be submerged. Cities and countries like the Netherlands and Japan may disappear. The governments invest billions into the programs to postpone the inevitable flooding. Sooner or later, those 40% of people will have to move inland, leaving the coastal cities behind. The livable areas will be overpacked. Humanity will experience the brunt of overpopulation. The flooding of the densely populated ports of Calcutta and Shanghai will cause not only human suffering, but also economic losses. Melting will destroy seaport infrastructure and disrupt the intercontinental trade as all ports will have to be rebuilt. The fishing industry will have to be fundamentally overhauled. Water will also cover much of the fertile land. Therefore, agriculture and the entire food sector of the world economy will be affected. Any good news? Oddly enough, yes. Along with cataclysms, scientists point to possible positive environmental and economic outcomes of the Arctic ice caps and icebergs melting. Unfortunately, it is a small solace, as it will in no way compensate for the losses. We can only hope that it can provide opportunities for the adaptation of human life in fundamentally new conditions. The list of opportunities is not shot and will be presented gradually. Many experts believe that by 2100, most of the Arctic waters will be completely free of ice, which would open new routes for maritime cargo transportation. A new route between Northern Europe and the countries of Asia will open through the North Sea. It will be 40% shorter than the route through the Suez Canal. At present, the Northern Sea route is passable only for caravans led by icebreakers during short summer months. The recession of glaciers will bring new opportunities for mining. The Arctic Shelf, for example, is one of the most promising sources of hydrocarbon reserves, and Alaska hides large deposits of gas, oil, copper, and nickel under ice. Territories which are now inaccessible in terms of subsoil development, Antarctica and Greenland, may offer the salvation for mankind after loss of many areas of mineral deposits. After discussing the unwelcome future that global warming can bring, we hope mankind will invent and implement innovative technologies for ecologically clean energy. We can stop and reverse global warming to save our planet. Mankind must live more responsibly and reduce its carbon footprint to prevent future catastrophes. Fortunately, there is time to make changes for the better. All we need is a will and determination to change for a better future so we can avoid a grim scenario. As we just learned from the video, it is better for mankind never to see what is covered by Antarctica ice.
but we know how another biggest desert on the Earth looks like. It yields in size only to Antarctica. There is nothing but sand all around. In terms of area, it is about half the size of Russia or the entire size of Brazil. It is the Sahara Desert. Relatively recently, life flourished on these vast territories in an impressive variety. But then, something went wrong. What's under the sands of the Sahara? To begin with, let's start with the basic information about the Sahara. The desert is really huge, 4,800 kilometers from west to east and 800 to 1,200 kilometers from north to south. It occupies 30% of the African continent. Its area is 8.6 million kilometers. That's more than the territory of Brazil. Is this whole vast area just sand? No many people would be surprised, but sand covers only 20% of the Sahara. In those places, you can observe the typical, well-recognizable landscape with picturesque dunes. The average thickness of the surface sand layer is about 150 meters. There are isolated ridges of up to 300 meters, but the rest of the Sahara is mostly rocks and cliffs. The sand, rocks, and stones hide amazing secrets, which you are about to learn. The desert is much more interesting and mysterious than it may seem. Long ago, scientists hypothesized that in the past, the Sahara was not a lifeless desert as it is now. It used to be a beautiful, blooming paradise. However, for the lack of convincing evidence, it remained only a theory until recently. Scientists found something unexpected, hidden right in front of their eyes. Under the sands of the desert, scientists found a huge reservoir, which clearly was not part of any of the ancient seas. It turned out to be left from an ancient paleo lake formed about 250,000 years ago, when the Nile broke through a low channel in the area of today's Wadi Tashka Bay on Lake Nasser. The water flooded the eastern Sahara, forming a lake that at its peak covered more than 108,000 square kilometers. The size of the ancient lake was four times bigger than Erie, or two times bigger than Lake Michigan. There was also a smaller lake, about 48,000 square meters, formed at the same time. Traces of both lakes were first discovered in 2010 by U.S. National Air and Space Museum geologist Ted Maxwell and his colleagues, studying data from one of the space shuttle's radar topography missions. Using images of waterborne and windborne sediments, as well as stable rocks visible with radar under the desert sands, geologists could draw contours of an ancient mega lake. The extreme aridity of the desert contributed to obtaining precise data on the prehistoric secret beneath the Saharan sands. The low humidity and the uniformity of the geological structure allowed the radars to catch all detailed features of the subsurface. Scientists located fossil fish remains found in the sediments about 400 kilometers west of the Nile River at about 250 meters above sea level to mark the lake's highest shoreline. By combining the data into one model, the researchers confirmed that the Nile once flooded the entire Kasiba Tushka depression in Egypt, creating a giant lake. The location of Paleolithic human settlements near the Salima and Tarfawi areas of Egypt also points to a presumed lake. The lake existed for many thousands of years, supporting the spread and development of a wide variety of flora and fauna. However, due to its abrupt emergence, it was doomed in the long run. The water was receding and evaporating faster than it could replenish itself. Eventually, the lake dried up and its bottom was swallowed up by sand. But life continued to thrive in the area. Many scientific studies show that at least 5,000 years ago, the Sahara was covered in lush vegetation and filled with life. Why? In 2015, scientists could provide a comprehensive explanation to answer the question. 
In 2015, the Nature Communications Journal published an article that stirred up scientific circles with the results of new research. With the help of the radar observation scientific tool Pulsar, phased array-type L-band synthetic aperture radar from the Japanese satellite ALOS, advanced land-observing satellite, scientists discovered the bed of a large river with an extensive network of tributaries. The Taman Rosset River is an enormous paleo river believed to have flowed through West Africa as recently as 5,000 years ago. Its sources were supposedly in the south of the Atlas Mountains and the Ahagar Mountains in modern Algeria. The river was named Taman Rosset after the oasis town in Algeria located in that area. The river, with its numerous tributaries, was over 500 kilometers long and flowed into the Atlantic Ocean in the region of Mauritania. Scientists believed that in ancient times, the Taman Rosset River Basin was abundant in animals and plants. It completely dried out over 2,000 years. If the river existed today, it would have been the 12th longest among the rivers on Earth. There is scientific speculation that the river was impermanent. It may have been appearing and disappearing for the past 245,000 years. The period coincides with the existence of the ancient lake in question. In any case, the river was a valuable water source that made the area in the middle of Africa into a blooming green paradise. Even nowadays, some traces of big water can be found there. They are famous oases of the Sahara fed by currents and underwater reservoirs hidden under the sands. The story of the Sahara is even more interesting and surprising if you dig even deeper into the sands of time millions of years ago. In prehistoric times, everything was different. During the Mesozoic, the waters of the Tethys Protocean actually covered what is now the Sahara. The ancestors of today's whales, the Bylosaurus, lived there in great numbers. Their huge fossilized remains were discovered during the excavations of Wadi El Hitan in Egypt. The bones of these animals remained at the bottom of the ocean for millions of years, until the ocean gradually disappeared, transforming into early versions of the Mediterranean and Black Seas. The ocean floor rose up and became land. Due to the abundance of identified fossils of the ancient ocean, the Sahara is sometimes called the Valley of the Whale. Believe it or not, you can find not only ancient sea inhabitants under the sands in different places of the Sahara, fossilized bones of a giant titanosaurid sauropod dinosaur are a striking find that generates scientific interest. The giant dinosaur reached 32 meters in length and weighed up to 60 tons. But even that discovery was far surpassed by the discovery of the remains of a previously unknown species of ancient monsters. In 2016, archaeologists made a new impressive discovery in Egypt. Egyptian and American paleontologists, led by Dr. Hessian Salem of Mansour University, dug out the fossilized bones of a creature called Mansurosaurus. Their discovery made a sensation in the scientific world. In 2018, the fossils were finally classified as a new ancient species and genus. It became a holy grail for the world of paleontology. But as amazing as the Sahara's wildlife past has been, the most interesting thing is how humans managed to live in these territories. Let us read amazing stories from dramatic pages in the history books of ancient humanity. We need to look under the sands of the Sahara. People lived on the territory of the modern Sahara for many thousands of years. Because of the variability of the climate, they came and went. They built settlements and later abandoned them. Archaeologists found human remains indicating several different communities. Some groups presumably had a higher level of organization than primitive pastoralism. The lowlands of the Fayum and the Nabta region, with their large amount of sediment, as well as the oasis of the Bir Kasiba, became habitable at a certain point due to increased rainfall. The population migrated down the Nile, 
and from the 10th millennium BC spread across the Eastern Sahara. From the 7th millennium BC, large settlements with a high degree of social organization were located there. Pottery was discovered in Napt with the earliest samples dating to the 6th millennium BC. It is decorated with complex colored ornaments and resembles in style the Nile Valley ceramics near Khartoum. Archaeological findings indicate a higher level of social organization than the one in the Nile Valley. It is important that several ancient megalithic compositions have been discovered at Napt. Presumably, they are archaeo-astronomical monuments of antiquity, like Stonehenge. There is a high probability that at least one of these megalith structures is a calendar circle, one of the first in history. At the same time, scientists, including astrophysicist Thomas J. Brophy, suggest that these structures had applied religious meaning. According to him, the sacred symbols in the archaeological records of Napta Playa date back to the 5th millennium BC. Their simple meaning conveys topics of great practical importance to nomad life. Cattle, water, death, earth, sun, and stars. There are more man-made structures of historic interest buried under the sands of the Sahara. These are fortresses built by the Garamantes, the ancient people of the Sahara mentioned by Herodotus. They inhabited most of the territory of the Sahara from 200 BC to 700 AD. It was already a desert, but the Garamantes learned how to extract water and built canals that irrigated fields and farms and provided drinking water to towns and fortresses. Three-dimensional satellite images allowed scientists to see the smooth edges of ancient man-made channels hidden under the sands. But the dry climate gradually took over. As the channels dried up, the sand swallowed the settlements. Let us reassure our knowledgeable audience that talks of extraterrestrial creatures belong to science fiction. At the same time, the Sahara keeps evidence of interplanetary events that have survived in its sands. On the lifeless sandy Barshans and rocky plateaus, you can find a very rare mineral called Libyan desert glass. This glassy rock is 98% silicon oxide, SiO2. At first glance, Libyan glass looks like regular broken bottle glass of yellow-green color with numerous shades. Libyan glass has been known since ancient times. It was used to make the scarab beetle, a symbol of fertility for the ancient Egyptians, which decorated the medallion of Tutankhamun, one of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs. The medallion was first discovered by British archaeologist Howard Carter during the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1916. The question of the origins of the Libyan glass is uncertain. Libyan desert glass has been dated as having formed about 29 million years ago. There is no generally accepted theory of its origin up to date. Most scientists believe that the glass formed during meteorite impact on Earth. The glass has high temperature minerals such as batalaite, ZrO2, and muasinite, SiC, which require temperatures above 1,600 degrees Celsius to form hotter than any igneous rock on Earth. Proponents of the comet hypothesis believe that Libyan desert glass is an altered material of comet nuclei. However, there is not enough reliable data to prove the comet hypothesis. That is why it has not yet found broad support in the scientific community. The same could be said about the meteorite hypothesis. There were no meteorite craters located near most of the Libyan glass places. It changed in 2007 when the Kibera crater with a diameter of 31 kilometers was discovered 100 kilometers away from the site of glass finds. Perhaps the Kibera crater can explain the origins of Libyan desert glass. The Sahara Desert holds many more amazing secrets. The most amazing fact about it is that it used to be like the blooming green garden of Eden in the distant past. But the same can be in store for the future. According to Kathleen Johnson, assistant professor of Earth Systems at the University of California, Irvine, 
the Green Sahara period, also known as the African wet period, was caused by the Earth's ever-changing orbital rotation about its axis, a pattern which repeats itself every 23,000 years. Hence, in as little as 10,000 years, the Sahara could once again turn into the Garden of Eden. However, those estimations can be off because of anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases, which cause climate change. It is unclear when the Sahara will become green again, or if it will happen at all. Without waiting for 10,000 years, it is possible to visit a Garden of Eden on the other side of the Earth right now. It is the world's oceans. The world's oceans are so poorly explored that if you dive deeper than 3,500 meters, there is a good chance that you will encounter a new species of animal unknown to science. Today, we're going to dive deep to the very depths. We'll find out how the floor of the ocean looks, what the ocean consists of and what happens there, and who or what we can find there. We are going to dive into those very troughs where the underwater conditions are practically alien. What was found in the deepest places of the ocean? So, our imaginable submersible sets off. We will make short stops at important marks until we get to the bottom. 40 meters. It is the maximum depth for pearl collectors diving without any scuba diving equipment. They do it by holding their breath. Below that mark, the increasing pressure of the water forces air to escape the lungs. That is why it is the maximum depth for recreational divers. 200 meters. 90% of all aquatic life exists in the layer of the world's oceans to a depth of 200 meters because light still somehow manages to penetrate through the water. It creates the conditions for phytoplankton to grow. Its vast biomass feeds small crustaceans. In turn, those are food for fish and large mammals like whales. As we dive deeper, there's less light and less life. We enter the twilight zone, 332 meters. It is the record for deep diving with the scuba diver equipment. No one was able to dive deeper without a bathyscaphe. 565 meters. It is the maximum recorded diving depth of the emperor penguin. Photosynthesis is almost non-existent here. Not enough light. Therefore, there is no vegetation. However, we can find a relatively large number of fish. But for most of them, it is no longer the most friendly environment. They do not look here for good life. They go deeper in an attempt to hide from predators. 1,000 meters. It is the end of the twilight zone. There is less than 1% of the sunlight, but the inhabitants learned to emit their own light. They use bioluminescent chemical reactions to attract prey or deter predators. Up to a depth of 1,000 meters, there are siphonophores. They are the closest relatives of jellyfish. They live in colonies, clustered around a long tube. It serves as their common digestive system. As we go deeper, life forms become more bizarre and alien. 1,027 meters. It is a record of a military submarine dive. As we continue the dive, we enter a midnight zone where total darkness reigns. Food is extremely scarce, and ocean life is forced to conserve energy. Most animals do not hunt actively, but drift and collect sea snow, microparticles of dead fish remains, plant, feces, dust, and sand. 2,200 meters. It is the depth to which giant octopuses and even more giant sperm whales dive. Sometimes they even fight deadly battles at the depth. We can also find the anglerfish with a luminescent fin ray to lure other fish. For its prey, a glowing bait looks like a juicy food. In fact, the luminescence comes from symbiotic bacteria. 6,100 meters. 
it is the depth at which transcontinental internet cables are laid on the ocean floor. More than 90% of ocean is about 6,000 meters deep. It is considered the conditional bottom of the ocean. However, there are many places where the ocean sinks below its own floor, much deeper. We're talking about the famous ocean places. Let us visit the deepest and most famous one. The Mariana Trench is on the border of two lithospheric plates. It was formed due to subduction, submergence of one plate under the other. The Pacific Plate under the Philippine Plate. It was formed in its present form relatively recently, about 180 million years ago. At that time, the first mammals already existed on land. Contrary to misconceptions, the Mariana Trench is not a hole in the seabed, but a huge formation, 2,542 kilometers, more than five times the length of the famous Grand Canyon in the United States. It is also relatively narrow, averaging about 70 kilometers. With such dimensions, it is not surprising that there are several deepest places, more than 10,000 meters deep. The Challenger Abyss is the most famous. It is located in the southwestern part of the trench, 340 kilometers from the island of Guam. According to various data, its maximum depth ranges from 10,028 meters to 11,034 meters below sea level. The second deepest place in the ocean is also in the Mariana Trench. This is the Siren Abyss, 200 kilometers east of the Challenger Abyss. Its maximum depth is slightly less, 10,809 meters. Interestingly, the deepest place is not the nearest place to the center of the Earth. Our planet is not perfectly spherical, but slightly flattened at the poles. Because the planet bulges along the equator, the radius at the poles is about 25 kilometers less than the radius at the equator. Therefore, the Arctic Ocean seafloor is closer to the center of the Earth than the bottom of the Challenger Abyss. Because of its enormous scale, the Mariana Trench has a special environment with some dramatic variations in conditions. For example, at its very top, at a depth of only 414 meters, there is the Daikoku Volcano. You can observe a rare phenomenon a lake of pure molten sulfur underwater. The black substance boils at a temperature of 187 degrees Celsius. There is an even more amazing place. It is called black smokers. These are hydrothermal springs at a depth of about 1600 meters, which shoot out highly mineralized water under pressure of hundreds of atmospheres, with a temperature of up to 450 degrees Celsius. According to the hypothesis, a billion years ago, the black smokers became the cradle of life in the ocean. As for the existence of life in the Mariana Trench, for a long time, scientists believed that it is possible only at relatively shallow depths. The high pressure at the very bottom of the Challenger Abyss and the temperature of about one degree were considered hostile conditions for any life. However, the first manned expeditions proved otherwise. Two Americans, Jacques Picard and Don Walsh, were the first people to visit the Challenger Abyss in 1960. They descended to 10,918 meters in five hours on the deep diving research bathyscaphe Trieste. At this mark, the explorers spent 20 minutes and saw almost nothing because of the clouds of silt raised by the apparatus. However, they spotted a flat fish in the beam of the searchlight. It was a scientific sensation that they found signs of life at such depth. However, the mere spotting of fish was inconclusive, and the scientific community braced itself for years of waiting for the next expeditions. The wait till March 24th 1995. On that day, a Japanese probe Kaiko was lowered to the maximum depth of the depression and recorded a level of 10,911.4 meters. 
It also brought back samples of silt, where scientists discovered microscopic living creatures. Foraminifera are single-celled organisms with a mineral skeleton. In July 2011, another research expedition used special models, drop cams equipped with digital video cameras and powerful flashlights to explore the deepest places of the ocean. The most impressive find was a gigantic foraminifera. It was huge for single-celled organisms, over 10 centimeters in size. The next expedition was taken in 2012 by Hollywood filmmaker James Cameron on the one-person human-occupied vehicle Deep Sea Challenger. Later, scientists found about 200 species of invertebrates in soil samples brought back. Finally, in December 2014, Another expedition reached a depth of 8,145 meters and found complex multicellular organisms. Scientists found previously unknown fish, which looked like snailfish. The fish is considered the record holder for deep water. There are no other fish there except snailfish. The good news is that that species has no natural enemies at this depth. Now, let's go almost to the opposite side of the globe to look into another interesting oceanic depression. The Puerto Rican Trench is located on the boundary between the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean on the site of a geological pit. It is the deepest depression in the Atlantic. Its lowest point is at 8,376 meters. It is called the Milwaukee Depth in honor of the U.S. Navy ship Milwaukee, the ship that first found it. The notorious geographical discovery was made on February 14, 1939, but the exact depth was not measured until 2018. It was found by state-of-the-art equipment, the Kongsberg EM-124 multi-beam sonar. Later, a retired U.S. Navy officer turned private equity investor Victor Voskovo completed a first manned dive on the roster into the Puerto Rico Trench, the deepest point at the Atlantic Ocean on December 19, 2018. Like many other deep places in the ocean, it is a very turbulent place geologically. Seismic activity has already had catastrophic consequences for the neighboring islands especially the island of Puerto Rico. On October 11, 1918, due to a seven-point earthquake, a tsunami wave struck the west coast of the island. More than 100 people were killed, and the damage amounted to tens of millions of dollars. Some geoscientists believe in the possibility of a powerful volcanic eruption in the near future, which in turn will cause a disaster there is a geological anomaly associated with the Puerto Rican Trench. According to NASA, there is a super-dense geological formation under the trench. It is so dense that it has an increased gravitational impact on the ocean's surface, causing it to subside slightly. It explains a negative impact on the accuracy of navigation devices. The fauna of the trough is fascinating. In 2012, a robotic bathyscaphe descended to the bottom of the trough and photographed a swarm of amphipods, small crustaceans. They were caught and brought to the surface for analysis. The same expedition video recorded invertebrate creatures, which in no way should be here. Later, Dr. Stace Bolu of the Woods Hole Oceanic Institution identified one by its soft, dark carcass length of 10 to 20 centimeters. It turned out to be a sea cucumber of the genus Paneagon. He also recognized a representative of the crustacean family Monopsidae in another creature. The fact of their existence at such extreme depths forced scientists to make serious adjustments to the theories about the survival of species. Now, let's look into the Kermadec Trench in the Pacific Ocean. It is located at the eastern foot of the Kermadec Islands and connects to the Tonga Trench in the north. Its length is about 1,200 kilometers. It was discovered in 1889 by an expedition of the British ship Penguin. 
The depth is also only slightly less than the Mariana Trench, 10,047 meters. The trench is interesting with its specific animal species discovered by research expeditions. For example, in 2012, the amphipods Alicella gigantea were found at the bottom of the depression. Their size puzzled and confounded scientists. They were up to 34 centimeters long, while most of the crustaceans found elsewhere are much smaller, about two centimeters long. The gigantic size is a paradox resulting from extreme living conditions at great depths. Deep sea fish of the Liparian family were also found in the trench. To be more precise, it is a special biological species, Notoloparis kermadescensis. It is the second deepest fish with a very narrow range of depths from 6,472 to 7,561 meters. The discovery of the pearl fish in the Kermadec Trench caused a sensation. It was found at a depth of 8,200 to 8,300 meters. It was an unusual find because the pearl fish live much closer to the surface, at 1,800 to 2,000 meters deep. How these creatures got to extreme depths and survived remains to be explained. What if we do not dive underwater, but dig deep into the earth? Well, it's time to discover what's hiding in the depths of the earth. Is there any life? Any interesting and exciting things there? What is found in the deepest wells? In the entire history of studying and reclaiming the Earth's interior, the vast majority of wells were made for a purely practical purpose, to explore and extract minerals. But some still pursued purely scientific goals, and they were some of the deepest ones. This can be simply explained by the fact that the structure of the Earth's crust was also studied in the course of regular commercial drilling. And in order to advance further in scientific research, you need to dig deeper, to a place where there is no longer any commercial profit and only pure scientific interest remains. So far, humanity is only taking the first steps in physically studying terrestrial depths. The deepest wells don't yet even reach the mantle, as the crust is 30 kilometers thick throughout the continents. It is much easier to get to the mantle from the ocean floor, where the Earth's crust is only about five kilometers thick. The American project Mohol tried to achieve this back in the 60s, but unfortunately, it didn't bring any results. More recently, in the early 2000s, the Japanese made such an attempt as part of the Chikyu project, but it only yielded partial results, failing to reach the mantle. As far as the prospects of getting to the core of the Earth, this isn't beyond the scope of science fiction. The depth of the outer part of the Earth's core is 2,900 kilometers, which is unimaginably deep. To put this into perspective, the ISS orbital station orbits the Earth at an altitude of about 400 kilometers. That is, it's still incommensurably easier for us to get into deep space than to the core of our own planet. The legendary Kola Superdeep always remains the record holder for a number of amazing discoveries. With a depth of 12,262 meters, it is still the deepest well on the planet. It was among the few ones that were originally designed solely for research purposes. Scientists have set a goal to study the most ancient rocks of our planet and learn the secrets of what was going on there. The Baltic Shield near the Kola Peninsula was chosen as the drilling site. Scientists chose this particular location because some of the oldest igneous 3 billion year old rocks come to the surface here. And the Earth itself is just a bit older, about 4.5 billion years old. That is, digging deep into this ancient geological formation, scientists had a chance to see the Earth in its infancy. Well drilling began on May 24, 1970. It took four years to reach 7,263 meters deep, 
It was drilled with a serial processing unit that is usually used in oil and gas recovery. After that, a new drilling rig with turbine drilling was mounted where only the drill head was rotating instead of the entire string. The turbine was 46 meters long. It ended in a drilling head with a diameter of 214 millimeters. It was ring-shaped and had an undrilled rock column in the middle a core with a diameter of 60 millimeters. A core receiver pipe ran through all sections of the turbine with the collected columns of mined rock. The main goal was to obtain this core. The string immersed in the well with drilling fluid weighed about 200 tons. Just keep in mind that specially designed light alloy pipes were used. If the column were made of regular steel pipes, it would break under its own weight. Inevitably, there will be some accidents as you drill deeper and deeper into the crust. The most dramatic one happened after a team took some time off to participate in the International Geological Congress in Moscow. On September 27, 1984, they got back to work. And this became the most unfortunate day in the history of the Kola Superdeep. The well didn't forgive being left unattended for a long time. When the team stopped drilling, some of the walls that weren't fixed with a cemented steel pipe became deformed. The column was lifted as usual, but then it jammed and broke when the team was trying to remove it. A turbo drill and five kilometers of drill pipes remained in the well. Five years of work went down the drain. Of course, the work went on. Several drilling attempts were made to bypass a challenging area with stuck equipment. This is a well-established practice that involves drilling a new route from a certain point. There were quite a few difficulties and accidents. The team hit a dead end quite a few times. Therefore, the well is not structured as a single line, but rather a complex route with multiple branches resembling some bizarre giant planet. It took the team another six years to reach the depth of 12 kilometers once again. In 1990, the maximum of 12,262 meters was reached. Keep in mind that the thickness of the Earth's crust on land reaches 30 kilometers. The well was over 12 kilometers deep and was the greatest engineering achievement at that time. But it didn't even reach half of the crust's thickness which is itself very thin on a planetary scale, especially when compared to the underlying almost 3,000 kilometer thick mantle. This was followed by a few more accidents and people lost hope of getting any deeper than that. We've done everything possible from an engineering standpoint back then. It seemed as if the Earth no longer wanted to reveal its secrets. And so the drilling stopped in 1992. Despite the fact that we've reached over 12 kilometers depth instead of 15 kilometers that was initially planned, the Kola Superdeep project proved to be more than successful from the scientific standpoint. Researchers received valuable information every few meters of drilling. We were quite glad to discover a new ore horizon, such as fairly shallow industrial deposits of copper nickel ore at a depth of about 1.6 kilometers. An even more interesting find was a geochemical anomaly, a rock layer with a high gold content of up to one gram per ton. The only thing is, this layer was discovered as deep as 9.5 kilometers, where it is unprofitable to extract the valuable metal. But this still had scientific value. In addition to practical data on subsoil useful for industrial applications, Scientists received groundbreaking information on the real structure of the Earth's crust. The geological profile forecast of the well didn't prove to be true. The structure they expected to see for the first five kilometers turned out to stretch for seven kilometers and was quite surprisingly followed by some low density rocks. The basalts predicted to lie at a depth of seven kilometers weren't found at all, even when they reached 12 kilometers depth. The deep seismic sounding of the site was done before performing the work. 
scientists believed that there was a zone in which granites transitioned into a more durable basalt layer, where they registered the greatest reflection. In reality, it turned out that less hard and dense fissured rocks, namely Archean Genesis, were lying there. That is, everything we thought to be true about those depths was proven wrong. This revelation took scientists by surprise. No one could have predicted this. But this new information has shown the data from other deep geophysical studies in a different light. The researchers didn't always succeed in extracting rock samples at great depths. Take, for example, the core column we've mentioned earlier. When raised to the surface from a great depth, even such an exceptionally hard material as granite crumbled due to the pressure drop. Scientists often need to deliberately slow down the lifting of the core, even taking a few days in order to preserve the sample in its original form. Scientists were even more surprised by the depth's temperature and how it changed as they moved deeper. At first, the temperature was expected to increase by about 11 degrees per kilometer. However, at a depth of 2.2 to 7.5 kilometers, this figure has already jumped to 24 degrees per kilometer. It turned out that the temperature was about 70 degrees Celsius at 5 kilometers depth and climbed to 220 degrees when they reached the 12 kilometer mark. This is much higher than was initially predicted by scientists. Quite amazingly, 14 types of fossilized microorganisms were found at the depths that were believed to have no organic matter, and those deep layers were over 2.8 billion years old. At even greater depths, where there are no sedimentary rocks, the researchers found a huge concentration of methane. And all of this is just the part that the general public can easily understand about all the amazing discoveries made at the Kola Superdeep. Humanity was humbled once again about how little we know about our own planet. The Kola Superdeep also holds another record for the number of hoaxes. The most popular legend says that having reached a certain depth, the microphones on the drilling module recorded eerie, non-technogenic sounds. A recording of these sounds was even shared on the internet. People immediately developed a conspiracy theory around this event, saying, scientists drilled a well right into hell. Once again, we'll debunk this myth for those who hear the story for the first time. Firstly, there were no microphones on the drilling equipment at the Kola Superdeep. There were sensors that recorded environmental fluctuations, but this had nothing to do with the sound recording, at least in the common sense of the word. Secondly, one of the Finnish newspapers became the primary source of the urban legend about the hellish drilling rig which coincidentally released the publication on April Fool's Day, April 1st. However, there were some strange incidents at the Kola Superdeep, which might have indeed inspired some hoax makers. One of these events was a major accident that happened under strange circumstances. The director of the Kola Superdeep Research and Production Center, academician David Guberman, gave the best account of what happened in his interview. When asked about this mysterious story at UNESCO, I didn't know what to say. On the one hand, it's complete BS. On the other hand, as an honest scientist, I couldn't say that I know exactly what happened here. A very strange noise was recorded, followed by an explosion. A few days later, nothing of the kind was found at the same depth. So after all, things at the Kola Superdeep are not as simple as they seemed to be. Who knows? In 1995, the project was closed and the well itself was sealed. Perhaps the next generation of scientists following Guberman's steps will see for themselves what happened there. In 1974, American researchers almost managed to reach a drilling depth of 10,000 meters. An ultra-deep well created in the Anadarko Oil and Gas Basin in Oklahoma reached 9,583 meters, breaking all records known at that time. Moreover, this was incredibly fast. It took just 502 days for the team to reach this mark. 
the work cost Lone Star $15 million, a huge figure at that time. Unfortunately, Bertha Rogers turned out to be a complete failure. The fact is that it initially pursued a commercial goal as the team was looking for oil. But instead of oil, the drilling turbine plunged into a whole underground sea of molten sulfur. This reminded many people of the underworld. Due to its futility, the project was quickly closed, and this was the end of the story. Something much more interesting happened a decade later in the other part of the globe. The Swedish project of a 7-kilometer exploration well emerged thanks to an interesting alternative theory on the origin of fossil hydrocarbons. In the 1980s, the scientific community hypothesized that oil and gas were formed not from perennial layers of dead planets, but from the so-called mantle fluids. These are hot gases and liquid mixtures saturated with hydrocarbons, which are formed in the mantle and seep into the Earth's crust on their way up. This bold assumption had certain implications. Since hydrocarbons are formed in this way, Oil and gas reserves can be contained not only in sedimentary, but also in volcanic and metamorphic rocks. The theory was not only of scientific, but also commercial interest, and many people wanted to test it. The project was quickly funded, and Sweden decided to conduct a large-scale experiment. Scientists chose the Siljan Ring Crater with a diameter of 52 kilometers for drilling. According to geophysical data, calcined granites lay at a depth of 500 to 600 meters, which could cover the underlying hydrocarbon reservoir. Scientists have measured gravitational deviations with great precision. This information is highly valuable in understanding the composition and density of rocks occurring in the depths. The results indicated the presence of highly porous rocks at a depth of 5 kilometers, which presumably contained oil and gas. The drilling results themselves came as a huge disappointment for scientists and investors who invested $60 million in this project. The strata they worked on didn't contain commercial reserves of hydrocarbons, but only sporadic oil and gas deposits of a pronounced biological origin. In 1990, the project was closed. Still. This well has puzzled many researchers and was at first a source of disappointment for many of them. But the following happened. On July 11, 1987, while fishing for a lost line, a sticky, black, mineralized material was found on special fishing tools. When the drill pipe was brought to the surface, it was found that the inside of the lower section was filled with about 60 kilograms of a strange, black, jelly-like substance resembling asphaltine. It was mined at a depth of 5,945 meters. A preliminary analysis of the black material established that the main component was magnetite with an admixture of paraffinic hydrocarbons. There have also been found biomarkers closely resembling those previously found in the vicinity of the Siljan Ring Crater. The researchers suggested that the black material is a product of vital activity of an underground population of bacteria that use non-biological hydrocarbons migrating from the Earth's mantle in their life cycle. The alleged discovery has been widely reported in the popular scientific literature as proof of the mantle methane hypothesis. This was going to be a worldwide sensation. But here, the skeptics of the alternative theory raised their voices. The answers came from a complex combination of accurate calculations, careful analysis, scientific intuition, and the tenacious mind of the project participants. The scientists were able to find a connection between the unique fossil substance and regular technological processes at the oil rig. A week before the black substance was discovered, a special mixture of commercial soda, polymers, and biodegradable lubricants was applied to the drill bit. This was necessary to free the drill string, which was stuck at a depth of 5,945 meters. The technical mixture circulated for a day following these procedures. And after that, the drill pipe became stuck. So, judging by the chemical and isotopic characteristics of the black mass, 
It followed that this jelly-like material was formed as a result of structural changes in the previously mentioned biodegradable non-toxic lubricants. They were affected by caustic soda, diesel fuel, and hydrocarbon inclusions from local lake water. As a result, the extreme conditions of depth, pressure, huge mechanical loads, and high temperature turned a mixture of quite ordinary materials into something completely unusual. Perhaps similar extreme depth and pressure conditions have caused many shipwrecks. There's one place in the oceans that has particularly sinister fame. In the distant 15th century, Christopher Columbus's expedition faced something that made the whole team panic. The Great Discoverer Ship Journal contains accounts of the compass needle going haywire, huge spurts of flame appearing out of nowhere, and the sea giving off a strange glow. Many years later, this dead place proved once again how sinister it is. Ships disappear without a trace here. Sometimes they are found drifting empty and completely desolate. But more often than not, we don't even find wrecks. But it's not only the ships that go missing. Planes disappear too, even entire squadrons of military aircraft. Facts and rumors about these incredible phenomena have quickly spread around the globe. And soon, this region of the Atlantic became known as something sinister, and it continues to uphold its eerie reputation even today. You've already guessed it. This is the Bermuda Triangle. What kind of supernatural power is hidden under its waters? And what does science say about all this? The Bermuda Triangle. For starters, let's refresh the most notable incidents that brought the Bermuda Triangle its loud and sad fame. The training sailing ship HMS Atalanta left the Royal Navy Dockyard in Bermuda for Falmouth, England on January 31, 1880. The ship didn't reach the British Isles. It hasn't even left Bermuda. It simply disappeared without a trace. It was assumed that the ship sank after encountering a severe storm on its route and that the crew wasn't experienced enough to handle the situation. At that time, the whole world was eager to learn about the ship's fate. When the ship went missing, the Admiralty received over 150 telegrams and 200 personal calls from concerned friends and relatives. The missing ship made headlines, and the public demanded an explanation. People came up with all kinds of plausible theories, but neither the wreckage nor the bodies of the dead, let alone survivors, were found. HMS Atalanta's disappearance has remained a mystery. The coal carrier Cyclops, loaded with manganese ore, left the island of Barbados on March 4, 1918. A few days later, it disappeared without a trace, along with a 309-people crew. This incident is responsible for the highest number of non-battle casualties in U.S. Navy history. There are many hypotheses regarding the loss of the USS Cyclops. Some people blame a strong storm. Others blame the overload and the structural damages caused by cargo and others even suggest an attack by the Imperial German Navy. But the fact remains, the ship disappeared without a trace in the ocean area that later became known as the Bermuda Triangle. This is a five-masted commercial schooner, Carol A. Deering, built in 1919. On January 31, 1921, it was discovered by the Coast Guard on Diamond Shoals near Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. The ship ran aground and the Coast Guard was ready to rescue people in trouble, but it turned out that there was no one to save. The ship was empty, no crew, no passengers. Unfortunately, further search efforts for the missing people didn't yield any results. As usual, there are multiple hypotheses explaining this incident. From a pirate attack, 
to the inexplicable disappearance staged by the team itself. Flight 19. This was one of the most famous and sensational incidents, and it happened not with a ship, but with a whole group of aircraft, which inspired researchers to come up with more and more paranormal explanations of the Bermuda Triangle. Flight 19 was a training flight for five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers. According to the squadron's flight plan, they had to go 141 miles east of Fort Lauderdale, then 73 miles north, and then back for another 140 miles to complete the training. The aircraft never returned to base. The entire squadron disappeared over the Atlantic on December 5, 1945. Moreover, a further rescue expedition with PNM Mariner seaplanes also ended up in disaster and casualties. One of the mariners also disappeared in the same area along with a crew of 13. Flight 19 was just the first link in a chain of similar aircraft incidents. In the future, aircraft continued to disappear in this area. On January 30th, 1948, an Avro Tudor four passenger plane, also known as Star Tiger, disappeared when flying from the Azores to Bermuda. Almost one year later, on January 17th, 1949, another plane disappeared when flying from Bermuda to Kingston, Jamaica. And this also was an Avro Tudor IV, which even had a similar name, Star Ariel. It was as if the devilish triangle favored these particular models. On December 28, 1948, Douglas DC-3 NC-16002 went missing on a flight from San Juan, Puerto Rico to Miami. No trace of the aircraft or 32 people on board was found. The Civil Aviation Board's investigation found that there was not enough information to determine why it disappeared. On September 26, 1955, a pleasure yacht, Connemara 4, was found adrift in the Atlantic, south of Bermuda. The ship was empty, with no crew or passengers. The people were never found. It seemed strange that the yacht was intact, and it's unlikely that the crew would have voluntarily left it without a clear threat of drowning. And planes again. On August 28, 1963, a pair of US Air Force KC-135 Stratotankers collided and crashed into the Atlantic 300 miles, 480 kilometers west of Bermuda. There are no more mysteries here. Well, they collided, such things happen. But again, why in the Bermuda Triangle of all places? One can't help but think that things are not as easy to explain as they might seem. Judging by the dates, you might think that all this happened a long time ago, but that's not the case. The next incident happened just recently. The 29-foot Mako Cuddy cabin with 20 passengers on board was reported missing a day after it was due to arrive in Lake Worth after crossing the Gulf Stream from the Bahamas. It was last seen on December 28, 2020. Looking for the ship or passengers yielded absolutely no results. There were no records of any distress signal Search efforts involving aircraft and boats lasted 84 hours and covered an area of 17,000 square miles, which is about twice the size of the state of Massachusetts, but to no avail. These are just a few examples. In total, there are dozens of recorded strange incidents that happened in the Bermuda Triangle area. People have come up with all sorts of theories, bold assumptions and skeptical revelations concerning the Bermuda Triangle and its strange events. And of course, a lot of research has been done in this field. You'll probably be surprised to hear that for all its mystery, the Triangle area is one of the most explored places in the oceans. But it's not only because of the mysterious disappearances of ships and airplanes. 
many expeditions were sent to the area of the Bermuda Triangle to study the Gulf Stream, the ocean's influence on the weather, the seabed and its minerals, as well as the geological structure of the Earth's crust deep under the ocean floor. Those who consider the Bermuda Triangle to be a true death trap are right, at least from one perspective. This is indeed an extremely complex ocean region. Huge shoaliness and deep water depressions, a complex system of sea currents and intricate atmospheric circulation all coexist in this region. And now you'll learn all about it. Let's start from the very seabed. The bottom configuration in this ocean region is well studied. It's even known what lies several kilometers under the seabed. On the Florida Shelf in the Bahamas and Bermuda region, a lot of drilling and geophysical research was performed. There is also an amazing variety of seabed landforms in the Bermuda Triangle, which is hardly found anywhere else on the planet. There is a shelf with shallow banks, a continental slope, marginal and median plateaus, deep straits, abyssal plains, and deep sea trenches. This wide variety is very rare to come by in such a relatively small ocean area. Scientists conducted a planimetry of a large-scale morphological map of the seabed and established that the Bermuda Triangle area can be arbitrarily divided into two parts, the southern and northern ones. The southern one includes the Florida Shelf, the Bahama Banks, the Straits, and the Puerto Rico Deep Sea Trench. In this part, the seabed's shape looks very striated. Extensive shoals alternate with straits and great ocean depths. The northern part of the triangle is more calm and has a relatively uniform bottom topography. The wide shelf turns into a spacious deep water plain. In its north and east, some seamounts and a rather large Bermuda Plateau arise. Seamounts? Now this is where it gets interesting. In fact, a mountain is too strong a word, but there are several groups of seamounts in the northern and eastern parts of the triangle. Some of them even have names, but most remain unnamed. The fact is that they're only 150 to 200 meters high. By surface standards, these are not even mountains, but hills. But for the seabed, these are quite remarkable formations. These small mountains in the area have a rather peculiar, almost regular conical shape. Lower cones of less than 100 meters are more numerous, and these are actually called underwater hills. Their round or elliptical shape is easy to notice when looking from above. The slopes of 10 to 30 degrees aren't that steep. The foot can range from several kilometers to several tens of kilometers in diameter. Seamounts and even slopes in this area have a regular shape, which is sometimes complicated by several terraced steps. In the first case, the mountains look just like cones. In the second one, they look like huge plinths with several smaller cones on top. Interestingly, there are much fewer seamounts in the Atlantic Ocean than in the Pacific. In fact, there are around 10,000 individual seamounts in the Pacific Ocean, while the Atlantic Ocean bed has only about 600. And the point is not that the Atlantic Ocean is smaller in size, but that the geology of the Pacific Ocean is more diverse. But in the Atlantic, there are also places with some unusual seabed shape. Perhaps it's not a coincidence that the most interesting configurations are found mostly in the Bermuda region. The islands that lent their name to the entire Bermuda Triangle are precisely the peaks of the largest seamounts rising from the Bermuda Plateau. Some rise from the bottom of the ocean on their own, and others form groups. The original material that formed the seamounts is basalt, but it's hard to see because the mountains are covered with limestone deposits. The limestone platform that forms the bottom of the Bermuda Triangle is a unique geological formation. The limestone deposits here are almost six kilometers deep, 
And all this thick layer is the remains of ancient small creatures. This ocean area is also interesting because the northernmost coral reefs on the planet are found here. And for hundreds of millions of years, the natural conditions that we see here now remain virtually unchanged. In general, scientists haven't even found consensus on the very origin of Bermuda. In 2019, a large international group of geologists published an article in the Nature Journal showing that Bermuda was formed as a result of highly unusual volcano activity. Previously, scientists didn't study such a mechanism of volcanic activity, but it may have contributed to the formation of some other volcanic archipelagos of the world ocean. The fact is that volcanoes are most often formed at the divergent plate boundary. This is clearly visible on the mid-ocean ridges. It can also be found in subduction zones, such as near the coast of Japan, where one plate sinks under another. Alternatively, volcanoes emerge due to persistent vertical magma flows that rise from the mantle depths and gradually melt the lithospheric plate above. It is this process that gave rise to the Hawaiian Islands that continue to form even today. For many years, it was believed that the ancient, long-extinct volcanoes that once raised the Bermuda Islands from the bottom of the Sargasso Sea were triggered by the mantle plumes. Indeed, a stable plume was observed in this area. On the other hand, such a plume could leave a characteristic chain of islands, such as Hawaii. It emerges as a result of the slow crust movement over a stable vertical magma flow. Also, there's no volcanic activity in the area affected by this flow today. To sort out these inconsistencies, geologists conducted an additional analysis of an 800-meter core from Bermuda back in 1972. They detected a very unusual mineral composition, as well as lead isotopes and some other heavy elements. The research results gave rise to several hypotheses on the origin of Bermuda. According to the most plausible theory, the disruptions in magma flows lifted and mixed the matter fragments of ancient plates preserved in the mantle transition zone. This may seem unclear, but once you understand all this, you'll be surprised. Let's remember that the entire Atlantic Ocean emerged about 175 million years ago as a result of the split of the Pangaea supercontinent, which previously contained almost all of the planet's land. The plates that today form Africa, Europe, and the Americas parted, giving rise to an ocean between them. Numerous plate fragments plunged into the mantle under the ocean bed, sinking into the transition zone at a depth of about 400 to 600 kilometers. About 30 million years ago, mantle flow disturbances made several of this semi-molten debris float higher while merging, mixing, and interacting with water. Such a process could create not only Bermuda with its unusual geology, but also some other volcanic islands in the oceans. Yep, the Bermuda Triangle was a very unusual place tens of millions of years before it became mainstream. But what rises above the water in the Bermuda Triangle has its opposite. And that's even more interesting. After all, there is nothing but the Puerto Rico Trench. The deepest point in the Atlantic Ocean, the Milwaukee Deep, lies in the Bermuda Triangle. The Puerto Rico Trench is 8,380 meters deep at this point. According to other estimates, even deeper. Perhaps a coincidence? It seems to be a little too much of a coincidence. However, the Puerto Rico Trench is also well studied. In fact, as much as modern technology allows. The 8 to 10 degree slope located closer to the island of Puerto Rico is a little steeper. The slope facing the ocean is more moderate and has only three to five degrees. The Puerto Rico Trench is medium-sized. Its length is 1,550 kilometers. To put this into perspective, 
The longest trench on Earth, the Peru-Chile, is 5,900 kilometers long, and the deepest one, the Mariana, is 2,550 kilometers long. But the Puerto Rico Trench is up to 120 kilometers wide, which is one of the widest ones on Earth. For example, the Marion Trench is twice as wide. The total area of the Puerto Rico Trench's bottom is 186,000 square meters. Science fiction writers often imagine that the deepest parts of the ocean hide mysterious forces and unknown creatures. The Puerto Rico Trench seems to inspire such ideas. However, nothing mysterious or supernatural can be found at its bottom. There are only silts, volcanic ash, and layers of fine-grained sands in some places. Special deep-sea organisms live in bottom sediments and above, such as sponges, holothurians, worms, and other living creatures. And, of course, deep-sea fish in the water column. Well, after all, although extremely unusual, the bottom of the Bermuda Triangle still lacks anything completely mysterious. Perhaps we'll find something interesting in its very thickness. At first glance, the structure of the triangle bottom seems unremarkable. Here, one can mostly find regular sedimentary rocks such as limestones, sandstones, and clays. This layer's thickness ranges from 1 to 2 kilometers in the Bermuda Plateau area and up to 5 to 6 kilometers near the Bahama Banks. The average rate of sediment accumulation is approximately 6 millimeters per 150 years. That is, it's safe to say that little has changed in the Triangle seabed over the past 120 to 130 million years. But this is only at first glance. There's something in this area that haunts not only mystery seekers, but also quite famous researchers who are concerned about safe seafaring. We are literally talking about a time bomb. A real gas bomb we know almost nothing about. And where and when it will explode. Now this is where it gets really interesting. In the hopes of explaining some of the strange ship disappearances, scientists and enthusiasts are desperately trying to balance between bold hypotheses and a rigorous scientific approach that rules out hoaxes. Therefore, there aren't so many bold theories. One of them concerns eruptions of methane hydrate deposits, a special form of natural gas. The presence of large deposits of methane hydrates on the continental shelves has been scientifically proven. The only question is whether the rapidly released masses of these substances can sink a ship. Some very serious experiments were performed to find it out. For example, a group of Australian researchers conducted a series of simulations. The results were actually promising. When experimenting with smaller ship models, artificial gas eruptions sank the models quite easily. This was due to a sharp decrease in the water density. It has been suggested that intermittent methane interruptions may create areas of foamy water that can't provide sufficient buoyancy for ships. Such an area formed around the ship could cause it to sink very quickly and unexpectedly. Hence, the lack of distress signals. They simply couldn't be sent in time. The debris would then be quickly swept away and scattered by the Gulf Stream. Hence, the disappearances are very hard to trace. U.S. Geological Survey publications describe large subsea hydrate reserves around the world, including in the Blake Ridge region near the coast of the southeastern United States. Now, everything seems to add up. But according to the same geological survey, there have been no major gas hydrate emissions in the Bermuda Triangle Zone over the past 15,000 years. I don't want to talk about any conspiracies here. Moreover, there exist a lot of well-founded explanations debunking the mysterious nature of even the most high-profile disappearances. 
but mysteries attract inquisitive minds. No matter how overrated the Bermuda Triangle is, no matter how far-fetched its secrets are, it inspires the curiosity of whole generations. And it's in the pursuit of mystery that humanity often discovered the true nature of phenomena that quickly turned from fantasies to indisputable facts. A huge number of far-fetched fantasies and secrets surrounded the next construction. This is the only one of the seven wonders of the world that has survived to this day. They call it the Great One, which seems quite fitting. The scale is truly breathtaking. It's 146 meters, 479 feet high. It consists of 2,300,000 stone blocks. Some of them weigh about 50 tons. The entire structure weighs about 6 million tons. It's like 16 Empire State Buildings combined. And all this was done by people who didn't know the wheel. For 38 centuries, it held the status of the tallest building on Earth. And it remains the most mysterious building, even now. There are so many mysteries, fantasies, and conjectures surrounding it because it's very ancient. Even its inscriptions were deciphered almost by pure luck. Otherwise, there would be much more secrets and fantasies. This is the Pyramid of Cheops. It was built with amazing precision. The perimeter of its base, divided by twice its height, gives the number pi to the nearest thousandth. Try it yourself on a calculator. It's impressive. Definitely, this wasn't a coincidence, since the proportion would have been different if the ancient Egyptians had made the pyramid higher or lower by just a meter. And this was done by people so long ago that no one even heard of the village that would later become Rome. By the way, we greatly underestimate the pyramid's age due to our perception of the distant past. Take the last queen of Egypt, the legendary Cleopatra. She was born in 69 BC, that is 2,090 years ago, or 2,091, whatever. We involuntarily perceive her as the same age as the pyramids. She was the queen of Egypt after all. But the construction of the Great Pyramid ended around 2540 BC, and it started 20 years earlier. That is almost 2,500 years before Cleopatra was born. Just think about it. For Cleopatra, the Pyramid of Cheops was more ancient than Cleopatra herself for you and me. Doesn't this blow your mind? Therefore, we perceive many things about the Great Pyramid's internal structure as something bizarre and mysterious, precisely because we are so far from fully understanding how people of that era lived, thought, and what they were driven by. But somehow, we still need to satisfy our boundless curiosity. In this video, you'll find out what's inside and under the Egyptian pyramids. What unusual things were recently discovered there? Where are the priceless artifacts and the pharaoh's body? And so much more. What do the Egyptian pyramids hide inside and under them? How can you get inside the pyramid? Initially, there was only one entrance to the Great Pyramid, the one made by the builders. It's located on the north side, 7.9 meters, 25.92 feet east of the pyramid's center line. This distance is equal to 15 royal cubits. 
The Egyptian measurement system was based on the proportions of the human body. The cubit was the main measurement unit and was equal to the distance from the elbow to the fingertips. So the builders of the pyramids applied the common cubit, while the royal cubit was used to determine the size of the inner rooms with the pharaoh's coffin. But although this is the original entrance, another one is used more commonly, the so-called robber's tunnel. Such a strange name comes from the very nature of the passage. It was built no one knows when by robbers who ransacked the tombs for centuries. This happened thousands of years before Lara Croft. And scientists still haven't come to a consensus on when and who got so confused as to gouge a passage as long as 27 meters, 88.58 feet in solid masonry. The robber's tunnel ends with a junction. There is a passage from the original entrance from above that goes down and an ascending passage going up. So let's start our creepy walk with the ascending passage. Why creepy? Because as soon as you go in the aisle, it feels quite unpleasant. And it's not about the curse of the pharaohs or other mysticism. It's just that the passage is narrow, dark and stuffy. The air is stale and heavy. In general, it wouldn't appeal to impressionable people and those who have even the slightest claustrophobia issues. Another junction lies 39.3 meters, 128.94 feet away and has a horizontal passage and the entrance to the Grand Gallery. Let's go ahead first. The atmosphere is the same, cramped, dark, stuffy, and gloomy. But something special waits for us in the end. The horizontal passage ends with the Queen's tomb. Yes, not only Pharaoh Khufu, but also his wife was buried in the pyramid. The Queen's Chamber lies exactly in the middle between the pyramid's northern and southern sides. Its dimensions are 10 cubits, or 5.2 meters, 17.06 feet from north to south, and 11 cubits, or 5.8 meters, 19.03 feet from east to west. It has a gable roof, 6.3 meters, 20.67 feet high. At the east end of the chamber, there's a niche 4.7 meters, 15.42 feet high. It was originally about a meter deep, but treasure hunters have significantly deepened it in the hopes of finding something valuable. Unfortunately, if there was something valuable in the queen's chamber, then it was stolen by robbers long before Herodotus who is widely known as the father of history. It's easy to understand robbers. In those days, even the pyramid's look hinted at the innumerable treasures inside. Did you know that it didn't look even close to how it looks now? The entire surface was covered with a smooth layer of dense limestone. In some spots, you could still see its remains. And at the very top of each pyramid, there was a pyramidia, a large pyramid-shaped stone, possibly covered with gold. If there was gilding, then the pyramidian shone brightly in the sun's rays, crowning the snow-white pyramid and spreading the light of Pharaoh's greatness for tens of kilometers around. This splendor, even in our time, would have dazzled anyone with its magnificence and grandeur. No wonder it attracted the ancients so much. Let's return to the junction and go up the ascending passage again. In a few meters, it connects to the Grand Gallery. Here, you can finally feel lighter and breathe comfortably. Although the passage becomes slightly wider, 
It already has an impressive height of 8.6 meters, 28.22 feet. In the Grand Gallery, we'll have to go 46.68 meters, 153.15 feet up the slope. Walking all this distance and looking up, you can see the strangely shaped walls in the corridor. They seem to be tilted inward, so that at the ceiling, the Grand Gallery is only one meter wide. In fact, this didn't come from lack of consideration, but on the contrary, the utmost care during construction. Thus, ancient engineers meticulously calculated the shape and laying sequence so that the pressure of a giant stone mass from above wouldn't break through the ceiling and block up the passage. The Grand Gallery ends with a small antechamber in front of the most important room, the Pharaoh's Chamber. It was this place that caught the special attention of scientists and enthusiasts fascinated by the ancient Egyptian civilization. The King's Chamber is the topmost of the pyramid's three main chambers. It is completely clad in granite. Its dimensions are 10.5 meters from east to west and 5.2 meters from north to south. The ceiling is flat. The chamber, about 5.8 meters high, and is formed by nine stone slabs, weighing in total about 400 tons. The walls are made up of five rows of granite blocks. There are no inscriptions, which is typical for the burial chambers of the fourth dynasty. The stones are matched with high precision. Facing surfaces are cleaned with varying degrees of thoroughness. The backsides of the blocks were only roughly hewn, as was common with Egyptian hardstone facade blocks. It was probably done to save effort and time. The only object in the king's chamber is a sarcophagus made from a single hollowed out granite block. When it was rediscovered in the early Middle Ages, it was already broken and empty. All of its contents have been looted long ago. If there was any content at all. Hang on a second. What? Don't worry, there are no conspiracy theories. Herodotus also claimed that the Cheops Pyramid was built in the Pharaoh's honor, but he wasn't buried in it. There weren't found any funeral-themed images or inscriptions on the walls of his burial chamber, and in those days, making such inscriptions in a room where no one was buried was considered great blasphemy. Many modern scientists follow this theory, believing that there are still rooms in the Great Pyramid that haven't been discovered, and the Pharaoh's body may rest in one of them, and along with it, the priceless artifacts of an unimaginably ancient and amazing civilization. And by the way, the latest research indicates that all this may turn out to be not far from reality after all. Later in this video, you'll find out what we are talking about. Despite slight frustration that naturally comes from seeing the gaping emptiness of the sarcophagus, very few people remain disappointed when they get into the Pharaoh's tomb. Touching such an unimaginable antiquity, such an original and great civilization is bound to impress you. But this isn't the end of our journey, but only the beginning. From the very top, we still have to go down to the very bottom. To do this, let's go back to the intersection and go further down the descending passage. Here, you'd have to go the longest distance of 72 meters, 236.22 feet. What makes it special is that most of the way passes not in the pyramid, but under it. The passage is carved into the limestone that served as the natural foundation for the Great Pyramid. What waits for us down there? There is another mystery, an unfinished chamber 
that is about 27 meters, 88.58 feet, below the level of the pyramid's base. Dimensions are approximately 8.4 meters, 27.56 feet from north to south, and 14.1 meters, 46.26 feet from east to west. It is about 4 meters, 13.12 feet high. The mystery is that the chamber isn't small, and the passage is long. Thus, the builders required a huge amount of effort and time to construct. But in the end, the chamber wasn't finished. What could have gotten in the way, and what was the chamber for? There's no single answer to these questions in the scientific community, as this equation has too many unknowns. Many researchers stick to the simplest theories, completely devoid of mysticism or any pretentiousness. For example, a prominent Egyptologist Chris Nountain told in an interview about his vision. According to Nountain, at first, he thought that the chamber wasn't finished because it lost its purpose after the plan had changed. Egyptian monuments were under construction for a very long time, and often what happened was you'd get the king suddenly die. Then it would be a new king, a new project, and they would either dismantle it or build it over. I suspect they were not as bothered by something not being finished said the researcher. Although the underground chamber is rightly considered one of the most mysterious places in the Great Pyramid, at least we can see and explore it. But the studies of the next few years, performed using the muon tomography method, literally shocked the scientific community. It turned out that inside the Pyramid of Cheops, there is at least one large void that we haven't known about all this time. In 2015, a high-tech and very promising Scan Pyramids project was launched. Scientists from universities of Nagoya, Paris, and Cairo were going to use special cosmic particle detectors to find anomalies inside the pyramid. You can loosely compare this method with X-rays. In the accessible spaces of the pyramid, scientists placed special, highly sensitive plates that registered massive particles called muons. These particles arrive directly from outer space and pierce the pyramid through, leaving a certain projection of the substance density on the detector plates. And so, in October 2017, the participants of the Scan Pyramids project announced a sensational discovery. They managed to find several previously unknown voids in the pyramid. At least one large cavity was clearly detectable. It lies directly above the Grand Gallery, is at least 30 meters long, and has the same width as the gallery. They even began to speculate that these are the real tombs of the pharaoh and his wife. Archaeologists and Egyptologists flatly refused the idea, accusing physicists of misinterpreting the data. The experiments were replicated many times on different equipment by different teams. The skeptics had to admit the Great Void undoubtedly exists. Unfortunately, five years have passed since then with no further progress. Although back in 2017, this discovery seemed incredibly promising and exciting. Chris Nountain believes that much more can be found there than we know now, including the Pharaoh's remains. Unfortunately, archeologists cannot get inside. The fact is that any attempt to go through the pyramid can cause irreparable damage, and this, of course, will never be allowed by the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities. More mysteries may lie, not even in the Great Pyramid itself, 
but in its vicinity and not on the surface, but deep under the desert sands. The topic first received the spotlight in the 21st century. So in 2009, British explorer Andrew Collins said that he had found a whole lost underground world of the pharaohs that was never known before. That's it, no more, no less. He claimed that a huge system of caves, chambers, and tunnels was hidden under the pyramids of Giza a whole underground complex inhabited by bats and poisonous spiders right in the limestone under the pyramids. There is untouched archaeology down there, as well as a delicate ecosystem that includes colonies of bats and a species of spider which we've tentatively identified as the White Widow, Collins said. The researcher didn't discover his find by chance and didn't stumble into it blindly. His research was inspired by the memoirs of the British Council General, Henry Salt. In his work, the diplomat told how he and the Italian explorer Giovanni Caviglia explored the underground system of the catacombs in Giza in 1817. The document says that Salt and Caviglia were exploring the caves at a distance of several hundred yards when they came across four large rooms that led to further cave passages. With the support of British Egyptologist Nigel Skinner Simpson, Collins reconstructed Salt's exploration of the plateau. Imagine his astonishment when he did eventually discover the entrance to the lost catacombs in an apparently unknown tomb west of the Great Pyramid. Indeed, the tomb had a crack in the rock that led into a massive natural cave. We explored the caves before the air became too thin to continue. They are highly dangerous with unseen pits and hollows, colonies of bats and venomous spiders, Collins said. Unfortunately, the researcher didn't provide clear evidence, perhaps because of scrutiny reasons. But other Egyptologists drew attention to the lack of specific facts, criticizing Collins' findings. Collins suggested that natural caves, which are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years old, could have inspired ancient Egyptians not only to develop the pyramids, but also their very belief in the underworld. Indeed, Giza was known in antiquity as Rostau, which means mouth of the passages, and it is believed that these passages led to the mysterious space underneath. The mouth of the passages is unquestionably a reference to the entrance to a subterranean cave world, one long rumored to exist beneath the plateau. Collins told Discovery News. Quite expectedly, Collins' statement caused a slight stir, skepticism, and even indignation in the Egyptological community. Zahi Hawass, head of Egypt's High Council of Antiquities flatly denied the discovery. There are no new discoveries to be made at Giza. We know everything about the plateau, he said. But Collins noted that after extensive research, he found no modern mention of caves. To the best of our knowledge, nothing has ever been written or recorded about these caves since Salt's explorations. If Hawass does have any report related to these caves, we have yet to see it, Collins said. However, then the topic received little publicity and attention, and everyone quickly forgot about it. Almost everyone. Of course, some enthusiasts continued their research and had to face some challenges along the way and not only because getting permission to access the non-tourist part of the pyramids in Giza is not an easy task. So, eight years after Collins recounts, 
Dr. Kathy J. Forty, a clinical psychologist and part-time fan of ancient Egypt, took up studying the underworld Giza. She and her colleagues still managed, if not to confirm Colin's discovery, but at least find a lot of interesting things in the dungeons that no one had descended into for many, many years. The goal of Forty's expedition was to descend into deep mines, which weren't really a secret, but didn't have particular publicity in popular sources. It turned out that it's difficult to obtain permission to explore what's below the Giza Plateau. Negotiations to enter the hidden mines began in 2017. According to Kathy, at first, the Egyptian authorities greeted the team with suspicion. It took them a long time to figure out who they were, what they wanted, and how they even learned about the mines. They claimed that no one had been there for decades. At first, the 40 team was denied access, but then they managed to get permission. By doing so, Kathy unwittingly opened the way for other explorers, proving that it's possible to get into the dungeons, at least on paper, and this isn't strictly forbidden. Forty tells how at 4.30 in the morning, she, along with her partner and a Giza Plateau inspector, wandered through the desert sands to the mine entrance with some flashlights. This was very serious, and they were even accompanied by a military police escort. They were led to a gloomy entrance with an iron gate. The inspector advised them to be careful and said that the group should expect as many as three lower levels. The farthest passages to the water tunnels are over 125 feet, 38 meters underground. The first level opened into a spacious but empty room. The air felt stale and dusty, and the temperature was much warmer than outside due to poor ventilation. The team continued their descent to the second floor, which was the longest one, and was poorly lit. Oddly enough, the room was lit by a regular bulb hanging from the ceiling. It looked very strange, given the overall surroundings. Naturally, the pharaohs didn't install the light bulb. This was done many years ago by unknown workers, and no one remembers what they were doing here. The second room was a room with seven niches for seven large sarcophagi. Only two black basalt and granite sarcophagi remained. Both were empty, with heavy lids ajar. They must have weighed several tons. Where the rest of the heavy lids are is still unclear, although they may not have been there in the first place. It is believed that this room was intended for the chosen ones, the guards who were usually the highest priests. The room and large cavities in it were discovered in 1993 which is very recent by Egyptological standards. The Osiris mine itself was first discovered even earlier, in 1933 to 1934, by the famous Egyptologist, Dr. Salim Hassan. He claimed that the tomb dates back to the Saite period. This is the 26th dynasty, which was around 600 BC and he called it the most unusual examples of this type of tomb. Others dispute this dating and believe that it goes back to even earlier times. At that time, large-scale research involving expeditions from several countries was conducted in Giza. Some of the described finds make us reconsider many ideas about what's under the pyramid. In 1935, absolutely incredible stories followed a 10-year project of excavation and clearing the passageways. An article published in the same year by Hamilton M. Wright described vast man-made spaces beneath Giza. The article said, 
we've discovered a subway used by the ancient Egyptians of 5,000 years ago. It passes beneath the causeway leading between the Second Pyramid and the Sphinx. It provides a means of passing under the causeway from the Cheops Pyramid to the Pyramid of Khephren. From this subway, we have unearthed a series of shafts leading down more than 125 feet, with roomy courts and side chambers. Like many other discoveries, Egyptian authorities deny this information, despite the pressing evidence. Let's go back to Kathy Forty's expedition. The last frontier, which she and her partner passed, led them to the last mine. And here, it became difficult to pass since the mine was flooded. Yes, there was plenty of water in the Egyptian desert, right under the pyramid. And it has been here for a very long time. At least it's known that in 1934, the third chamber was already underwater. Dr. Salim Hassan tried to clean the chamber, but after four years of trying to pump it out, the water level hadn't come down, meaning that the source of water here is constant. Local authorities didn't provide any explanations. It's difficult to suspect the Nile River as it's very far away. The group took water samples, and the test results turned out to be quite interesting. The team ordered a series of tests from a certified water analyzing lab in California. Consultant chemists were also brought in to interpret the test results. The biggest surprise for the 40 group was the water salinity. It turned out to be much higher than in the Nile River, but also significantly lower than in the Mediterranean Sea where the Nile flows. One might wonder, how so? The hypothesis that salts got into the water directly from the substance of the tunnel walls was disproven right away as the rock composition was different. So where did this salty water come from? The researchers began to analyze the location of the nearest water bodies, but still came to the most obvious conclusion. The only known lake with salt water in Egypt is Lake Karun which lies 20 kilometers southwest of the Great Pyramids. In prehistoric times, it was a freshwater lake with an estimated area between 490 and 656 miles. The lake's surface lies 43 meters below sea level and covers an area of about 202 square kilometers. We don't know exactly when the lake so radically changed its salinity and why this happened. So here's another tidbit. There is also a complex of pyramids in Kawara near the lake. Even in ancient Greek texts, there were references to an underground complex in Kawara that was called the Labyrinth and had about 12 large halls. Herodotus himself wrote that the labyrinths of Kawara and the Giza Plateau are connected by underground tunnels. This could well explain the origin of the salt water in the Osiris mine at Giza. And there is even evidence that the mines near Giza go farther than the known chambers. Dr. Kathy Forty's expedition discovered an entrance at the lower level, presumably leading to other tunnels. The research reports from the 30s contain the same information. But this, unfortunately, is as far as the answers go. The Egyptian authorities are extremely reluctant to give access to such mysterious places. The reasons are incomprehensible and can be anything from mystical and religious to purely utilitarian and even political. There is an opinion that the Egyptian authorities have a good reason not to open this Pandora's box where people may find something that will undermine established ideas about the history of Egyptian culture and people don't need to know about it. But if and when the restrictions are lifted and the many kilometers of the ancient underground subway network are actually discovered, 
then one could only envy the Egyptologists of the future. They will be literally swamped with a tsunami of new, absolutely mind-blowing discoveries. A real tsunami can hit in a completely different place. Our planet has a huge ice kingdom that supplies the ocean with 10 to 15,000 icebergs a year. But this is not Antarctica. It's here that the iceberg that sank the Titanic once broke off. 81% of an area the size of Mexico is covered with ice, which is occasionally over three kilometers thick. Nearly 2.5 million cubic kilometers of ice and snow. White Land would be a fitting name for this place, but its real name is the most paradoxical that one could think of. Greenland. Nobody knows exactly why that is. Perhaps we'll find the answer under the Greenland ice. It keeps secrets that can surprise and even scare you. What hides under the Greenland ice? Greenland doesn't hide one of its secrets under the ice but keeps it almost in plain sight. And for a long time, it gave researchers something to think about. This is a mysterious crater-like geological structure near the city of Monatsok. The formation's dimensions are more than impressive, about 100 kilometers in diameter. Naturally, the impact crater hypothesis arose, and it was even officially proposed in 2012. Scientists have suggested that three billion years ago, our planet collided with an asteroid or a comet in this place. Over time, the crater was partially destroyed by erosion and buried almost 23 kilometers underground. If the hypothesis were confirmed, it would be the oldest known impact crater on Earth. However, Hopes for a surprising discovery were destroyed when Canadian geologists tested Monet Soak's igneous rocks. They turned out to be identical to those found outside the supposed affected area. This means that they formed as a result of the same geological processes associated with a mysterious magnetic anomaly. The views on this anomaly were outlined in a study published in Earth and Planetary Science Letters. The strange structure appeared not because of a cosmic collision, but due to a mysterious ancient geological process whose nature is yet unknown. So at 2.23 billion years old, the Yarra Bubba Crater in Western Australia still retains the title of the oldest known impact crater on the planet. However, the scientific community wasn't disappointed for long. A few years later, Greenland brought yet another impressive surprise. Under the island's ice cap, there was discovered a forest. Of course, to be precise, there were only its signs, but it was still very impressive. And the history of discovery goes far back, almost to the middle 20th century. The U.S. Arctic Military Research Base operated in Greenland from 1959 to 1967. In 1966, scientists conducted a very complex and ambitious experiment, considering the technical capabilities of that time. They drilled a glacier to a depth of 1,368 meters, reached the subglacial soil, and extracted a 14-meter-long core. The last 3.44 meters was the soil resting under the ice for an unknown amount of time. The research base pursued mostly military purposes, so it didn't study the soil closely. The frozen core was literally left on the shelf and forgotten for many decades. And this turned out to be for the best since modern analytical methods weren't around in the mid 20th century and the unique sample would most likely have been wasted. But in 2017, someone remembered what happened in the past 
The sample was removed from storage and was carefully examined over the next several years. Fortunately, the researcher's arsenal now had such miracles of science as electron microscopy, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, cosmogenic nuclides, and all sorts of other state-of-the-art methods. So, when studying the samples mined in Greenland 1.5 kilometers under the ice, the stunned scientists found branches and leaves instead of sand and stone. As it turned out, the largest island on Earth didn't have an ice sheet until relatively recently and was covered with green forest. The study was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Ice sheets typically pulverize and destroy everything in their path, says Andrew Christ, one of the study's authors. But what we discovered was delicate plant structures, perfectly preserved. They're fossils, but they look like they died yesterday. It's a time capsule of what used to live on Greenland, he explained. The unexpected find is important not only for understanding the Earth's past. According to the most optimistic estimates, Greenland's glaciers, which are melting at a record pace due to global warming, contain enough water to raise global sea levels by over a meter. Understanding how this ice has disappeared in the past will help to better predict climate change that will occur in the next 50 years. And now, let's see another amazing discovery that shook the scientific world in the past 2021. It would seem that there's nothing supernatural in glacial reservoirs. Subglacial lakes have been discovered before, both in Greenland and Antarctica but one of these findings became almost a sensation. Most of these previously discovered lakes contain only water trapped in ice or between rock and ice. And the origin of these reservoirs comes from the melting water from the glacier itself. However, the recently discovered Paleo Lake most likely formed when there was no ice around it. And this means that we are dealing with a real time capsule that has preserved in itself everything that was here when Greenland was truly green land. The most valuable and fascinating thing that scientists discovered is the bottom sediments of a huge ancient lake hidden by the 1.8 kilometer Greenland ice sheet. This was the first time such a subglacial formation anywhere in the world was found. The study was published by the Earth Institute at Columbia University. The lake bed can be hundreds of thousands or millions of years old and contain unique fossil and chemical traces of past climate and life. Researchers have recreated a detailed picture of the lake basin and its surroundings. They analyzed radar, gravimetric, and magnetic data that was previously collected using aircraft flying at low altitudes over the ice sheet as part of NASA's ice bridge operation. Ice penetrating radar provided a complete topographical map of the land surface beneath the ice. This revealed the outlines of a smooth, low basin lying among the rocks. Measurements have shown that the basin's material is less dense than the surrounding hard rock, a clear indication of perennial deposits, including those of biological origin. All the data suggested that there was a huge lake with an area of about 7,100 square kilometers in this place. To put this into perspective, it's significantly larger than the state of Delaware. The researchers calculated that the lake was between 50 and 250 meters deep. The sediments at the bottom have a breathtaking thickness of 1.2 kilometers. It remains a mystery what these deposits might contain. However, the discovered lake bed may provide an intact, pristine archive of fossils and chemical markers dating back to an unknown distant past. This could be an important repository of information 
in a landscape that right now is totally concealed and inaccessible, said Guy Paxman, a researcher at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and the leading author of the report. We're working to try and understand how the Greenland ice sheet has behaved in the past. It's important if we want to understand how it will behave in future decades. And since we are talking about the future decades, other researchers have some bad news for us. The fact that the Greenland ice sheet is melting has been known for a long time. But only now an international research team has discovered that it could completely disappear by as early as the middle of this century. The lakes forming on the glacier's surface are at fault. They are rapidly expanding and merging into larger reservoirs due to global warming. Water seeps into the shield's base and stimulates destruction from within by transferring heat. Because of this, there appear cracks that accelerate other lakes running off. According to the researchers, such a chain reaction can accelerate ice melting by 400%. One of the research group members, Paul Christofferson of the University of Cambridge, confirmed this ice sheet was relatively stable 25 years ago, but now it loses a billion tons of ice every day. This causes one millimeter of global sea level rise per year, a rate which is much faster than what was predicted only a few years ago. Ecologists say that the glacier's core would never have been directly exposed to heat if it were not for the newly forming lakes. They used to take weeks or even months to appear, but now they appear in a matter of hours. To make a more detailed forecast, Scientists have created a 3D model based on observational data obtained in recent years. One of the proposed scenarios showed that up to 124 lakes can flow out in five days, with their networks reaching up to 135 kilometers long. This data suggests that the entire Greenland ice sheet could melt completely by the middle of the 21st century. Christofferson added, Transfer of water and heat from the surface to the bed can escalate extremely rapidly due to a chain reaction. In one case, we found all but one of 59 observed lakes drained in a single cascading event. Just think about it. We may well see a time when Greenland will turn into something completely different. For example, something like this. It's not difficult to guess what will happen to the global sea level. The melting of Greenland alone would raise levels up to several meters. The estimates vary greatly, but none of them bode well. It would seem that we should raise the alarm. In fact, environmentalists have been literally screaming about the impending disaster for more than a year now. But considering these terrible forecasts, Many analysts notice that Greenland's authorities are strangely passive, and this tacit agreement finds a rather transparent, albeit extremely cynical, explanation. Melting glaciers promise to make Greenland crazy rich. This is the village-like town of Narsak, in the south of Greenland, with a population of about 1,200 people. According to preliminary estimates, the nearby area contains up to a quarter of the world's reserves of rare metals. Nowadays, such elements as terbium, cerium, lathanum, and praseodymium are priceless treasures. And gold doesn't even come close to how valuable they are. These metals are crucial for high technology. They are used everywhere, from smartphones to nuclear reactors. And there are plenty of places like Narsak on the island, and even more places that are, for the most part, still deserted. Greenland has almost 40 million tons of rare metals waiting for their time to shine. For comparison, world reserves excluding Greenland are 120 million tons. One doesn't need to calculate Denmark's potential income on a calculator. It's simply mind-blowing. 
researchers continue to discover more and more previously unknown natural resource deposits in Greenland. Iron, zinc, vanadium, chrome ores, nickel, platinoids, and diamonds. All these resources haunt entire countries, not to mention profit-seeking magnates. Until now, Greenland's ice sheet has multiplied by zero any serious industrial exploitation of the island's natural resource. But global warming is bringing a new gold rush closer than ever. What's under the Amazon River? The Amazon is 6,275 kilometers long. This is the longest river in the world, which combines many smaller rivers. Many will object, saying that the longest river is the African Nile. But this question is still debatable in the scientific community and is subject to multiple interpretations. The main question is, what is considered the source? If the head of the river is Maranon, then the Amazon is 6,400 kilometers long. If we consider Apache the source, the Amazon becomes much longer, specifically 6,992 kilometers, and leaves a 6,650 kilometer long Nile far behind. And if the starting point is the source of the Ukiali, the Amazon is 7,100 kilometers long, and the Nile doesn't even come close to that. It's funny that the Amazon is so huge that some of its parts are called differently. Even without taking into account the confusion about the starting point, the Amazon changes its name six times along the way from west to east. In its middle part, the locals call it Solimois, and only the last relatively straight segment of the river, which accounts for a third of its total length, is called the Amazon. Many major tributaries of the Amazon get their names from the watercolor. And here, nature has a lot of fun playing with colors. For example, the water in Rio Negro appears black, while in Madeira, it appears golden scarlet, resembling the wine of the same name. Near Manaus in Brazil, the Rio Negro merges with the yellow and murky waters of the Solimois rushing down the slopes of the Andes. The two rivers fall into one bed and for a long time act like two immiscible liquids. The entire Amazon basin is a huge lowland covered with rainforest, occupying the northern part of South America. This territory spans across Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. The basin area is 6.5 million square kilometers. This is about 5% of the entire land surface of the planet. Again, this can be easily compared to the area of Australia, which is almost 7.7 .7 million square kilometers. Of course, the river is very deep, so much so that even ocean liners can go 3,700 kilometers upstream from the river mouth without any problems. At the lowest points, its depth reaches 100 meters, for comparison, Lake Erie is 64 meters deep. Of course, such a giant river system was formed over a very long time. Indeed, the history of the Amazon can be called an epic drama. The Amazon originated as a transcontinental river during the Miocene Epoch around 11 odd million years ago. Its modern outline formed about 2.4 million years ago in the early Pleistocene. But before that, over the course of many millions of years, the river formed, reshaped itself, and changed the flow direction to the opposite. At one point, it even turned into an inland sea. Back in the Cretaceous, the Proto-Amazon was part of the Proto-Amazon-Congo river system it flowed west from the interior of present-day Africa. Hang on, what? Did I just say Africa? Yes, that's what I meant. Throughout its history, the Amazon managed to move from one continent to another. I know that it sounds crazy, but it's nonetheless true, roughly speaking. At 
that time, two huge continents were connected, forming Western Gondwana. 80 million years ago, the two continents finally split. And so it happened that the Congo and Proto-Amazon rivers ended up on different continents and became separated not by a strait, but by a whole ocean. 15 million years ago, the main phase of the Andes uplift began. This tectonic movement was caused by the Nazca Plate sliding under the South American Plate. The rise of the Andes and the juncture of the bedrock shields of Brazil and Guyana blocked the river and turned the Amazon basin into a vast inland sea. Gradually, this huge body of water turned into a massive swampy freshwater lake, and marine animals adapted to living in freshwater. Between 11 and 10 million years ago, waters broke through the sandstone from the west, and the Amazon began to flow in the opposite direction, to the east. The Cenozoic Ice Age was long over by that time, and life in the Amazon began to thrive in all its diversity that we see today. In addition to these dramatic transformations on the surface, a lot has happened under the river basin over these millions of years. In parallel to the river, its dark antipode was forming deep underground. And scientists didn't even know about it until recently. In 2011, at the 12th International Congress of the Brazilian Geophysical Society in Rio de Janeiro, a group of scientists presented the results of extensive geologic research of the Amazon Basin. The report rekindled the scientific community's interest in the basin and became a source of much debate. Indian scientist Walia Manatal Hamza of the National Observatory in Brazil and colleagues used data collected from 241 abandoned oil wells in the area. Calculations have shown that there must be a large underground flow in this region. It's literally huge, and it's located right under the Amazon itself, but at a depth of four kilometers. The scientists immediately named this phenomenon in honor of its discoverer, the Hamza River. The only thing is, the term river can be applied here quite loosely. The data of many seismic sensors and other equipment in hundreds of old wells helped to identify the aquifer's location. It turned out that there is definitely a current, and it even follows the same flow direction as the Amazon itself but that's as far as the similarities go. The most obvious differences are the width and the flow velocity. While the Amazon is from one to 100 kilometers wide, the Hamza River is 200 to 400 kilometers wide. Scientists are quite certain about this, and the data can only be further specified, but not refuted. The underground river is about 6,000 kilometers long but the flow velocity is ridiculously low. While the average velocity of the Amazon is about five meters per second, the Hamza's speed is less than a millimeter per second. That is, Hamza doesn't really deserve to be called a river. This can be compared to glacier's velocity. Therefore, even the discoverer, Walia Hamza himself admits that the term river can only be loosely applied in this case. However, due to its immense capacity, the river Hamza contributes to the waters of the Atlantic. The discharge is about 3,000 cubic meters of water per second. Like the gloomy Amazon's twin, the Hamza follows its channel and flows into the ocean deep below its surface when passing from west to east. The Hamza and the Amazon rivers represent an unusual geological system of two rivers flowing at different levels of the Earth's crust. They are both major drainage systems of the Amazon basin. Thermal signatures of groundwater suggest that the Hamza flows west to east just like the Amazon except at a depth of about 13,000 feet, or 4,000 meters below the Earth's surface. Computer simulations suggest that a higher depth of about 2,000 feet, or 600 meters, 
the river actually flows vertically. But no matter how unusual the very existence of these rivers are, the most interesting and even somewhat creepy tidbits about the history of this region were discovered much higher. Look at this fossilized bone. Nothing special, right? It's just a vertebra after all. But this is a vertebra of a snake. Well, you can say, why not? There exists some huge snakes, like anacondas. There's no doubt about that. But here's an anaconda vertebra for comparison. How do you like that now? What kind of ancient monster is this that even the anaconda looks like a dull worm compared to it? A few million years after the well-known meteorite that killed the dinosaurs, Titanoboa appeared on the territory of modern Colombia. This is the largest snake ever. It could be up to 13 or even 15 meters long and weigh over a ton. The longest modern snake, the reticulated python, is half as long, no more than 7.5 meters. Such a monster, it would seem, could choose anything on the prehistoric menu, even ancient turtles or crocodile ancestors. But in fact, as surprising as it sounds, it mostly ate regular fish. Just as giant whales prefer microscopic plankton and all kinds of small fish. Titanoboa became extinct long ago, but there are still enough creatures in the Amazon basin that it's better to avoid. In the Amazon forests, there are about a hundred species of poisonous frogs alone. Some can literally kill a person with one touch. Then there are crocodiles, electric eels, piranhas, poisonous snakes, vampire bats, and big wild cats. Brazilian wandering spiders can also be found here. For a long time, they were considered the most poisonous among arachnids, and even got into the Guinness Book of Records in 2010. Since then, it has lost this title, but doesn't make it any less dangerous. The famous bullet ants also live in these places. They got their formidable name from the most painful bites that can hurt up to one day. There are also giant centipedes living here. Even sharks swim into the river from the ocean. Moreover, the anaconda mentioned earlier also inhabits these lands. It's hard to imagine how some human tribes live here. They still preserve their original culture and are reluctant to contact civilization. But they have lived here since time immemorial. Archaeologists are still finding traces of ancient civilizations. Most recently, monumental structures abandoned almost 600 years ago were discovered, which were hidden from the eyes of researchers in the dense forests of Bolivia. A large-scale study about this was published in Nature. The history of this discovery began 20 years ago when German scientists Dr. Heiko Prümers from the German Archaeological Institute and Dr. Carla James Betancourt from the University of Bonn began archaeological excavations on two mounds near the village of Casa Rabe in Amazonian Bolivia. This area is known as Llanos Mojos. It lies in the southwestern part of the Amazon River Valley. Llanos Mojos is a plain that is flooded during the rainy season due to the rising water level and remains underwater for several months a year. Apparently, this cyclicality has been observed here for many hundreds of years. Such natural conditions, it would seem, aren't suitable for permanent settlements. However, it is here that scientists have discovered many traces of an ancient pre-Columbian culture. Its time frame is not exactly established. Archaeologists suggest that it was at its peak around the end of the first and beginning of the second millennium AD. It was named after the nearest village, Casa Rabe. This culture's traces include not only man-made mounds, but also roads and canals, 
they often run for several kilometers in an absolutely straight line, cutting right through the terrain. Furthermore, scientists found that the settlements of the Kasarabe culture occupied an area of about 16,000 square kilometers, and the mounds turned out to be the destroyed foundations of the pyramids and other buildings. It became more and more interesting, and no one could even imagine what else was hiding under the Amazon basin in the upper soil layers and the forest's shadow. The architectural details of the monumental structures and their surroundings were hidden by dense Amazonian vegetation. To learn more about these mysterious places, researchers used LIDARs for the first time in the Amazon Valley region. These are laser rangefinders that scientists have adapted to scanning terrain from height. The LIDAR was attached to a helicopter, which then circled the area. A high-precision laser device produced one and a half million pulses per second, which made it possible to create a fairly accurate three-dimensional map of the territory. When the scientists superimposed the previously available maps with the locations of the Kasarabe culture artifacts on a new digital model, they opened up a striking view of two large areas of 147 and 315 hectares with a rather complex planning system. So far, we can't estimate how many people lived there. However, the layout of the settlements themselves suggest that a large and well-coordinated team worked here. Previously, the settlements have already been found in other parts of the world, namely in Southeast Asia and Central America in Sri Lanka. But only with the discovery of the Kasarabe culture, scientists were able to state for the first time that such settlements existed in pre-Hispanic times in the Amazon Valley. The researchers emphasize that we are just starting the real archaeological work in this region. The challenge for the future is to understand how these ancient cities functioned, where the settlers came from, and where they went. Radiocarbon analysis showed that the Kasarabe culture settlements were abandoned around 1400 AD. Why? For now, it remains a mystery. The Amazon basin holds many more mysteries like this. And sometimes, as you can see, we don't even have the slightest idea about their existence. Well, hopefully, the more interesting it will be to find out the answers. Space is huge, and it is as infinite as it is beautiful. Everything is perfect amazing geometry of impeccable shapes of any scale. And one of the brightest examples is right here on this side. Even the smallest children recognize this planet. Thanks to the Cassini mission, we have received many breathtaking images of Saturn rings from different angles. With bated breath, we imagine how this aesthetic sight would look in real life if we were on Saturn. It's a shame that the universe decided to show us this dazzling beauty only from afar. But what if our planet could also have rings? Maybe our dream comes true one day, and we'll even witness this great event. But it raises some questions. How quickly will we regret our dream's fulfillment and begin to beg fate to return everything back? if the Earth had rings. In 1610, Saturn and its rings were first observed by Galileo Galilei, but he couldn't see the rings around the planet. His signature 20 times telescope was a landmark invention of its time, but fell short even of modern smartphones. The great astronomer described what he saw as strange appendages on the sides of the planet. Galileo needed to name this phenomenon, and so he came up with an anagram. 
don't try to read it for fear of calling the devil himself. The anagram stands for, I have observed the most distant planet to have a triple form. A few decades later, another great astronomer, Christian Huygens, upgraded Galileo's telescope, creating his own device with a 50 times magnification. So it was beyond doubt that Saturn was surrounded by a ring. And as late as 1675, Giovanni Domenico Cassini discovered at least two rings nested inside one another. Now we know for sure that there are a lot of these amazing structures. They consist of small ice particles, silicate dust, grains of sand, etc. Less often, one can come across asteroids and even Jupiter satellites. Yes, some of Jupiter's moons are right in the ring's plane. There are different theories as to where the rings came from. According to one, they formed simultaneously with the planet 4.5 billion years ago. Another one poses this is what's left of destroyed comets pulled by Saturn's gravity. The rings are located exactly in the equator's plane. And this applies not only to Saturn's rings. This occurs due to the fact that the planets are not perfectly spherical, but slightly flattened due to rotation. This makes only the equatorial orbit gravitationally stable. Saturn has many rings that move unevenly. That's why there are clear boundaries between them. It's currently estimated that the whole ring system is 400,000 kilometers wide and 5 to 30 meters thick, excluding asteroids and satellites. We'll let that sink in, not kilometers, but meters. This is absolutely amazing considering that 400,000 kilometers is a little more than the distance from the Earth to the Moon, and 5 meters is virtually a nuisance. Of course, that's very interesting, but we don't live on Saturn. So let's go back to our planet, and we immediately face injustice. Saturn has huge rings. Uranus has a whole ring system. Neptune and Jupiter also have smaller rings. Even the dwarf planet Haumea. The asteroids Cariclo and Chiron have rings. The question arises, what is wrong with Earth? Why doesn't it have rings? The answer is, for no particular reason. It's just the way it is, because it didn't work out. It's nobody's fault. But perhaps they were before. 4.5 billion years ago, two planets collided. One was the size of the Earth. The other was the size of Mars. The second only tangentially touched the first. But the impact energy was enough for the small planet to collapse almost completely and impact the first one, scattering a lot of fragments nearby, which became the building blocks for a ring system around the planet. Then, a satellite of the first planet formed from the second planet's remnants and the matter from the rings. Have you already guessed? It's about the Earth and a hypothetical planet, Thea. This dramatic scenario gave rise to the giant impact theory, a common hypothesis on moon formation. This would all be really exciting if we had a time machine. But wait, what if Earth rings would suddenly appear right now? It might seem incredible. How could they after all? But at least this isn't against any laws of physics and the current alignment of forces in the solar system. Suppose a large asteroid will fly close to the Earth. It will be pulled by its gravity and gradually reach the Roche limit. This is the critical distance where the smaller body begins to fall apart due to tidal forces. Asteroid fragments would collide, breaking up into smaller pieces. They would gradually line up along the equator and form planetary rings. With some luck, it won't take long and we won't have to invent immortality to see what happens next. Let's imagine that the rings have already formed and humanity hasn't gone mad when astronomers were screaming about the approaching asteroid. 
How big could the rings be? To remain relatively stable, the rings need to be well above the exosphere, the lower boundary of the uppermost layer of our atmosphere, which is above 10,000 kilometers from the Earth's surface. Theoretically, the rings can extend farther for many tens of thousands of kilometers, but it's more likely that the rim of the Earth's rings will be less than 5,000 kilometers wide. The diameter of the entire system will be a little over 40,000 kilometers. This is far from the size of Saturn's rings, which are hundreds of thousands of kilometers. But when observed from Earth, it will still be something grandiose. Since the Earth's rings will be composed of silicate dust, grains of sand and pebbles, they won't shine as brightly as Saturn's ice rings. But believe me, it would be enough to instill a sense of awe. The rings will be visible from anywhere in the world, somewhere more, somewhere less, depending on the latitude of the observer. Even at the North and South Poles, a small arc of rings will be seen on the horizon. In temperate latitudes of both hemispheres, one will get the best view. For example, from New York, the rings will look like giant wide arches crossing the entire sky from the south side. And at the equator, the rings will be visible edge on right at the zenith. A smooth sparkling line from one horizon to the opposite at a right angle. This would be cooler than any laser show. An even more bizarre sight will be enjoyed from the equator at the equinox. The sun would go across the sky exactly at its zenith, and its disk will be divided exactly in half by a narrow strip of ring's edge. Crossed out in half by a black line, the sun would look like a gigantic lantern. The rings will be visible day and night. At night, the rings will glow like tens or hundreds of moons, reflecting the light of the setting sun. Except for the equator and the poles, most of the planet won't experience night as we know it. In clear weather, the rings will also be perfectly visible during the day. They would have the same silvery white hue as the daytime moon. But this is only a small part of the whole picture. The Earth will cast a shadow on the rings. During the day, one could observe the movement of the planet's shadow along the rings tearing them apart in the middle. Or, when looking from a different latitude, the observer could see the Earth's shadow biting off part of the rings. But there's far more to it. The real magic would happen when the sun passes through the sky behind the rings. Probably some areas won't completely overshadow the sun, but refract and scatter the rays. Passing through the ring's plane, Sunlight can become orange or red as at sunset. Perhaps the most impressionable viewers have already thought, if only we could see this bizarre light show. But any astronomer would be horrified by such a prospect. And rightfully so, as this charming miracle has a very creepy downside. We found out that the ring system will form in the equator plane. But there, we already have man-made rings, i.e. geostationary satellites. Here is how it looks in sensitive optics. So most likely, we'll lose satellites. Some of them will be destroyed by fragments, and some will leave orbit due to gravitational disturbances. If any remain, they are bound to malfunction. Satellite communications, television, meteorological observations, and much more may go down the drain. And not only won't we be able to launch new satellites, but we'll have no way of exploring space. But that's not a big deal. In the end, NASA will come up with something. Or we'll get grandmother's rotary phones from the closets, and civilization will gradually go steampunk. Why not? But Earth rings will give us so much trouble that not only NASA, but even Chuck Norris couldn't cope with. For example, we all know how quickly it becomes cold once the twilight sets in. But even though it would take many years for rings to appear, 
we'll feel the first disturbing red flags as early as the first days. It will get really cold really fast. According to various estimates, two years after ring formation, winters on our planet will become twice as cold. The climate will be totally disrupted. This will entail not just another big extinction of species. Planetary rings will bring us a new ice age. Plants will die and oceans will freeze. Optimists might think that it's not all that bad. Over time, the rings would disappear and life on the planet would flourish with renewed vigor as it happened more than once in history. That's right, but there is a caveat. NASA scientists recently realized that Saturn's rings will definitely disappear in almost 100 million years. No one knows how long it would take for Earth's rings to. Do you still want to see Earth rings in real life? <laughs>